Um, okay, well, it's, it's nine o'clock, so I'm just going to start, and I want to welcome everybody to our eighth live event at, at Parallax. Um, the other events have been lectures, the lecture format. This one's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a trialogue, which mm. is what me and Alexander do all the time with all kinds of people these days. Um, right. And, I call uh, them three Zooms. <laughs> three Zooms. Three Zooms. It's right. more so now it's, than trialogue. Yeah. It's kind of sexy. Uh, Happy too, to be part bit. of the threesome. We're having a threesome here, uh, and you're all welcome uh, to to watch. Um, uh, so anyway, this is the eighth eighth uh, eighth in our series um, on Parallax, where we talk about all kinds of stuff. It's a safe space for intelligent conversation. Um, we have podcasts, interviews, educational series. We're developing um, the whole the whole thing. And um, Alexander's been on before, and we definitely want to welcome Greg because we have a couple of massive minds here tonight, and and who have guys who have huge systems of, of thought. Um, so, I, what? I, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you guys to introduce yourselves and and your mission, and and also say I just say the the title perhaps of uh, the proposed title of this talk. We're here to talk about the psyche. And, and the proposed title of the sock was The Psyche is Dead, Long Live the Psyche. <laughs> okay. So, so welcome, Alexander Bard and Greg Henriquez. And, and mm -hmm. please uh, introduce yourselves and introduce sure. the topic for, for the yeah. audience. Why don't you start, Greg? Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Greg Henriquez. I'm a professor of graduate psychology at James Madison University. Um, and it's a true honor to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, my time spent with Alexander always is nourishing of the soul or psyche. Um, I am a long time, uh, have a long time love hate relationship with American psychology. Uh, I think that it's done some beautiful things and I think it's deeply confused. Uh, I'm a theoretical psychologist and a clinician. Uh, and I fell down a rabbit hole of sorts and came out uh, with sort of a unified theory, at least within a context of a bridge between natural science and uh, sort of a scientific philosophy that then stretches into humanism. Uh, about, what, two years ago, I encountered the brilliant Alexander Bard and uh, what he was cutting across uh, the line of philosophy and saw Synthism, Digital Libido, and then the trilo trilogy before then. And uh, he and I have had a number of uh, fascinating conversations, and it's a real honor to be here with him. Cool. Then uh, I'm Alexander Bard. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> specializing in the relationship between human beings and technology, which turns out to be what we call civilization to begin with. Uh, and I encountered Greg uh, and found him incredibly refreshing in that he tried to systematize psychology. Um, what I want to say here is that uh, to me, there are three different ways of approaching the human mind, at least when we approach it in a pathological manner, as I think we should. Uh, mm -hmm. There's psychology, which attempts to be social science to understand mm -hmm. the human mind. Right. There is psychiatry, which mm -hmm. is a natural scientific way to try to understand the human mind. This is why you go to see psychiatrists and they will give you pills. Because right. they will try to change your chemicals and your hormones, where the psychologist will work from the social field onto the individual fields with you. So this is the psychologist and psychiatrist. The third one is where I come from, and that's psychoanalysis. And we should, we should be very, very adamant here is saying that psychoanalysis is not a science. It should not try to be. Sigmund Freud a bit confusingly tried to have some scientific approach and basically called Jung that came after him killed that approach mm -hmm. because psychoanalysis is the artistic uh, or I would say shamanic way of approaching the, the human mind. And that's why I find the conversation very fruitful. I work myself as a psychoanalyst and I always feel that the strongest cases, the strongest solutions I, I can arrive at when I, when I, for example, try to treat people, help people in their lives, is by having both a psychologist and a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst present. That would be ideal, right? If you approach human mind, mm -hmm. because it's like the three different perspectives that together, sure. when they work, match each other perfectly. Brilliant. Um, and where this comes in and why I find it refreshing that Greg is American and not European, is that psychoanalysis it has a stronger history in Europe than it does in America, but with psychology is the other way around. Psychology mm -hmm. to me is something that maybe Friedrich Nietzsche tried to do, but failed that. Mm -hmm. But it, it was the founder of psychology, as far as I'm concerned, was William James. Mm -hmm. And William James was an amazing American philosopher. 
Absolutely. Uh, America has a fantastic school of philosophers called the pragmatists. Uh, they had their own Hegel, and that was Charles Saunders Peirce. Mm -hmm. And after Charles mm -hmm. Saunders Peirce came his friend, William James. And mm -hmm. William James, among many funny things, like the fact that he tried to be a panpsychist, mm -hmm. uh, William James was like, he, he's like somewhere between Nietzsche and Oscar Wilde, I would say. He's very witty and funny. <laughs> But James, James is a wonderful reader. And William James mm -hmm. really, all, I think still today when you study psychology, if you study the history of psychology, you have to start reading William James. Totally. So yeah, Principles and, and, of Psychology is the best book written for a long time. There Absolutely, you go. In my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, following Peirce and James, when I got into American philosophy and dug into it and loved it, was that they led on to Alfred North Whitehead, although he was born in Britain, mm. arrived in America and became a fantastic mm -hmm. mathematician and philosopher. And, and in the work I do with John Sedeckvist today, in some of the discussions I've had here with Andrew and Thomas mm -hmm. Emmerich, mm -hmm. we return to that philosophy that has arrived in a place somewhere between Hegel from Europe mm -hmm. and Whitehead from America. Mm -hmm. And it's in between these two giants that the West is now trying to redefine itself. Mm. So, Brilliant. yeah. So taking it back to the issue, I want to hear Greg's story on the psyche itself, mm. because well, Greg mm -hmm. and I agree, and this is important here, is that we work on something called emergence vector theory. That's what it's called right. the philosophy. So we work, we work on understanding the, the entire history of the universe up until now and into the future and understand it out of emergences. Like suddenly things happen that dramatically change things forever. Right. And Greg and I basically agree on which these emergences are. And this is interesting that he and I agree on this and we fight with others all the time because we actually mm -hmm. reached quite an agreement here. Mm -hmm. And the one that... The one we really agree on is, is the category of mind as something that comes out of biology, but is irreducible to biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And out of mind in parallel, also, there's another one called culture. Right. But I want to stay with the mind one in tonight's conversation. And I want to hear right. Greg's take on how did you arrive at mind or psyche, as it was called in Aristotle's mm -hmm. work? How right. do you write psyche or mind as an emergence category for you? Brilliant. Um, yeah, so I... My trail uh, was through empiricism originally. So I'm, I'm an empiricist psychologist, okay, who buys that we have to have measurement and analysis. And so I'm sort of established in scientific epistemology, all right? Uh, then I go into the clinic room, okay? But you, in order to be in the clinic room, you have to have a framework and a value structure, okay? And then all of a sudden, all the different competing views within psychology, not to mention social systems, psychoanalysis, and psychiatry, sort of made my mind go all fuzzy. <laughs> and I wanted to like figure out, hey, what would ground the, all of these psychological therapies? And I was like, well, there should be a science of human psychology, okay? Then I turned back around and asked the question, well, what is psychology? And I realized that psychology actually at a conceptual level breaks down completely. Um, unlike physics, chemistry, and biology, which has a fundamental set of consensus. If you ask what biologists, chemists, and physicists, what their subject matter is, you get consensus, okay? Psychologists didn't have consensus. Some people still say it's behavior. Some people say it's mind and behavior. Some people just say it's mind. Some think it has to do with humans. Some think it has to do with the entire animal kingdom. So there's an enormous amount of confusion, okay? Um, I had two key insights that set the stage for what would become the unified theory. Um, one was the relationship between primates and persons. And I developed a thing called the justification hypothesis and justification systems, which had to do with what turned us primates into persons was first language and then this problem of justification and building our narratives that give us meaning and coordinate material culture and give the explosion first to hunter-gatherer culture meaning-making, and then ultimately then with technology civilization, okay? So that divides persons from primates. And then that insight, well, what really was going on there was the emergence of a complex adaptive plane mediated by language, okay? And the communication, both information processing inside and communication within. And then it dawned on me that actually life also uh, can be thought of as an emergence that arises as an information processing storage, DNA, RNA, builds then proteins that then is in a cell that gauges in cell-cell communication. And the actually the same thing is for animals, okay? Animals, the nervous system collapses. There's a brain part and a, and a motors part, and that gets fused together around the Cambrian explosion. And you see the emergence of the animal kingdom, okay? And I think the term mind 
all right, which I mean that you can just observe in the world of animal behavior captures that unique set of behavior patterns. Um, it's a set of mental behavior. Uh, it's the form and function of sensory motor activity. Okay. And if you go back to Aristotle, what Aristotle said, the psyche was actually had three layers, vegetative, animal, and rational human. Okay. And it's the functional form of sort of the biology and then really that animal soul. All right. Uh, there's a beautiful book that just came out by Jablenka and colleagues called uh, the, the Evolution of the Sensitive Soul, which is right when that brain emerges so that it's tracking learning. It experiences pleasure and pain at around the Cambrian explosion. And that's a unique thing that then guides animals. Um, and really, that's the root for me of it's the lost animal soul, the sensory motor functional form of the animal kingdom. Yeah, this, this ties in really nicely where we were working at the moment. Because you're working with some, in philosophy, you work with very basic stuff. But right. you work on getting the really basic stuff right. Right. right? So what we work with here is something we call membranics. Mm -hmm. It's like mechanics, but it concerns membranes. And right. membranes are fundamental for life forms. Well, membranes are fundamental for any sort of system that has an outside and an inside. Exactly. Communicates <laughs> with the outside world. And what we mm -hmm. call it membranics, essentially think of it like you got to put a guy at the port. Yes. And this guy has to check who goes in and what goes out. Right. So you want to get nutrition in and you want to get shit out. Okay, totally. Right? Yep. Uh, now, now, any sort of membranics in itself, logically, sooner or later has to develop some kind of a memory because that yep. would be superior to whatever it competes with. And, and this is where memory comes into the picture. And, and memory then has to be there already in early life forms. So, so with life, memory mm -hmm. has to exist. And with memory, you start to have what I would consider to be the first, uh, something that we could call mind that it's more than just life and you're reducible yep. to life. And yep. there's an interesting term for this. It's called mm -hmm. cephalization. It's like, mm -hmm. what happens is that that specific part that is the memory is eventually so precious to whatever is inside the membrane so it has to be also the most protected part of mm -hmm. whatever is inside the membrane. That's you right. can't have your most precious part at the very outskirts or, or uh, at the limit or something, because then you might lose it very easily. Mm -hmm. You've got to protect it. So it's just like, you know, if you're going to reproduce and have a baby, you're a woman, it better be somewhere central <laughs> on the body, not just on the side. Like the dick. The dick can be disposed <laughs> with, apparently. But, you know, the matrix has to be very mm -hmm. central. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in a funny way, and this is called cephalization, because cephalization mm -hmm. is the process through which the memory bank gradually develops into its own sort of suborgan. Mm -hmm. right. And the suborgan has to be both independent and it has, needs its own conditions. That's exactly why the brain eventually, for example, you were being when we walk, the brain moves upwards so that becomes a head. Right. Why? Because that's the most protected place if you walk. Mm -hmm. It's furthest from the ground where snakes right. and all kinds of shit is. Mm -hmm. And also probably because of cooling process and other processes that are involved and the brain burns a lot of energy for mind to work, then this also to be separate. And I'm interested in seeing how you react to that because the cephalization that we're working with at the moment has a very, very important thing to understand as we move from memory to cephalization in understanding life forms. And this Brilliant. is what we start to approach. The yep. difficult question what is. Is really mind irreducible to biology or is it just an aspect of biology? Which is of course key if you're gonna understand mind as a separate emergence. Totally, all right. Um, so uh, I believe that, right, I believe that there is mind uh, is gonna be the network of information processing and communication that happens inside the nervous system and between animals. And that's gonna be as irreducible as a complex adaptive plane as life is not, uh, can't be reduced to matter. Okay, so, so, and the reason is precisely because, as you highlight, there's a memory function in both, there's an information storage function and transmission function, and a functional form communication system, okay? I think of cells <coughs> as having what I call protocognition, which is going to get into memory. Cells do this, and plants do this. This is before a nervous system, okay? Um, but then what we see, and so that's really important to realize that actually cells, just like you cut your body, how does it have the intelligence to heal itself? Okay. Your body carries, not nervous system related, but at the cellular level, carries information storage, okay, that can then enact and create an autopayotic system that's a complex adaptive system that shapes and heals itself. You know, that's a, that's a form of cognitive, that's a form of intelligence. Okay. Um, so I totally agree on that. 
And then I believe that there's a nested layer of information processing that happens within the cells. So just as DNA, RNA collects molecules together to give them a storage of information that then creates a functional form dynamic, okay? And I make a metaphysical point here. And what I mean by that is, is that um, if you go back to Aristotle's metaphysics, okay? So he's got substance and kinetic as well as functional and final metaphysical causes, okay? And then Galileo comes along in natural science and he hates metaphysics. He tries to get rid of them all, okay? And you don't need metaphysics of the formal and final variation at the level of just matter, okay? But formal and final causation, I think, are absolutely essential descriptive concepts when we get into what animals, what we get into what cells do. And the reason is they're processing the forms and they're oriented towards particular kinds of activity um, that can be described in terms of information processing, cybernetics, and those kinds of elements. Um, and what that does is it says, yeah, life's fundamentally different because there's these new metaphysical properties of functional and formal causation. Um, and I believe then that you get a jump clearly at biology and you get a second jump at the level of mind. Uh, in terms of the evolution of encephalization, what you see, I believe, uh, the, the nervous system evidence is showing that we had a motor reflex system that's distributed like in jellyfish. And then you get a bilateral shaping into nematodes that have eyes that then give you the first head. It's like in a worm. And then there is a sensory detected light system that's just determining where lights are and where other noxious chemicals are. That sensory control system then gets plugged in as you get a bilateral design in a body. And that's you get the, the brain on top of a motor nervous system. Those things plug in. Now you get the beginning of a body behaving as a whole. And then when that action system gets placed in like a complex active body, like an insect, a mollusk, and then of course the vertebrates, boom, you see the explosion of a wide variety of different super cool, what I call mental behaviors, uh, the behaviors of animals uh, that engage in functional awareness and response. Uh, so the time where we're hanging out with a dog, you know, we feel that deep, rich connection, don't we? Yeah. I hate to jump in here, if, if you don't mind, because uh, because you're you're telling a very rich story here. And But what I was hearing when you talk about cephalization, I was hearing a story that was evolving up to the idea of the unconscious, like the development of the unconscious. Does that have anything to do with sure. what you gentlemen well, right. are, are, are speaking of? Absolutely. About? So, I mean, it depend we'd have to be clear about you when know, you talk about have, memory and, and all that. Yes, people yeah. have different reference points for what they mean exactly by consciousness, okay, and unconscious. So I would want to get a little clear on that. But what you have here is the beginning of what I call the brain behavior system, okay? Um, and I also believe that like feeling pleasure and pain comes along pretty early. And that guides that animal towards what's good and it moves it away from what is bad. So if you mean by consciousness that it can have some, a jolt of pleasure and pain, um, I think that comes along pretty early. Uh, there's a recent neuroscience that's... Is well, actually, I said unconsciousness because, I, well, somehow I think that unconsciousness is a larger development and then consciousness is just like the tip of the... Let, let, right. Me, Ulster, let, right? Let, let me add something that is interesting, mm -hmm. where Greg and okay. I agree strongly and fight a lot of people out there. We think the idea of consciousness is extremely overvalued. Yeah. Okay? This is why we talk about mind all the time. Because mm -hmm. this is why people constantly end up in these stupid discussions on consciousness and unconsciousness and subconsciousness all the time back and forth. None of that is really necessary. When it comes to subjectivity, if you mean subjectivity, the subjectivity is a logical necessity for anything that is disclosed and has an outside and an inside. So we talk about membranics. This is why I talk about the strength mm -hmm. of philosophies that work with the basics. We talk about membranics. It's an absolute necessity. The first thing a memory constructs when a memory memorizes experiences so as to not experience the bad, but experience mm -hmm. the good over again, yep. like Greg says, the first thing it does is that he has to create an outside and inside. And, and the, the, the subjectivity is nothing but the inside, whereas the mm -hmm. objectivity is the outside of the membrane itself. So subjectivity is absolutely fundamental to anything that has an isolation towards an outside world has to operate that way, which definitely includes all life forms Hardly lower than life, but any life form, at least in its most fundamental sense, would have subjectivity. Now, consciousness, I don't know when I'm conscious or subconscious. Am I conscious when I say, I don't know. I don't know what people know what, me with these terms. Consciousness is a modern obsession that I think has mm -hmm. come out of a culture of strong individualism leading into narcissism. Okay, what about the human being, though? No, wait, wait a second. Let me the story finish. that Greg is telling no, is wait, about, wait, about yeah, the wait, animal wait, life, right? Yeah, but wait, wait, uh -huh. wait. So just to finish this first. The sense of self is something you arrive at at the end of a chain of events. 
-hmm. Essentially in psychoanalysis, the sense of self is something you experience very strongly. And you got a problem that you got to leave behind because you can't solve it now. So every time you, you, you have to mark something in your memory, like this is not solved, it has to be solved later because I have to prioritize something else right now. You get a sense of self. Ask any, any woman who's taking care of a baby with the diapers <laughs> while she's talking to her friends. She has four selves operating simultaneously very strongly, right? So mm -hmm. she's stressed, but she, works, she can handle it. Men cannot. But this is the sense of self. And essentially what we do is that we try to memorize senses of selves that we've had in the past. And they're still just memories and they're distorted. And, and we change them after a while and create new <laughs> narratives about ourselves. But we essentially remember as if we've had these ego momenta in the past. And we then connect these ego momenta into senses of self. John mm -hmm. and I worked this thoroughly through our books. And mm -hmm. basically why John and I did this in our work was basically to put the consciousness thing aside because mm -hmm. we're obsessed with mind just mm -hmm. like Greg. And that Greg mm -hmm. came to this point from the world of psychology that he was tired of the consciousness obsession and moved into the obsession with mind. We came from the world of philosophy on the other side of the pond, by the way, also mm -hmm. interested in mind and trying to deeply understand what mind is as irreducible to life, okay? Mm -hmm. This is what gets interesting. And, and all I can say here is that- But, but the, subject, yeah. the subconscious is also interesting, isn't it? I mean- Yeah, but uh, let's get back to that later, if it okay. is interesting. But, Let's not yep. overrate subconsciousness either. It's far more interesting than consciousness because it's basically what operates. Consciousness mm -hmm. is to me something that just makes up a story afterwards of what the subconscious did anyway. If right. you're horny, you're going to follow your horniness. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're stuck with your drives and your desires, whether you like it or not. That's the mm -hmm. lesson of psychoanalysis. Right. And I think it's also a smart psychologist would say something similar to you. I, but I, I think, yeah, but I think what's important here is to stress that what I want to go back to is that for me, though, we have to remember that we're doing narrative here. And, and a psychologist has to do narrative towards the patients. The patients are not there to be scientifically informed. Right. They're there to get help. That's yep. what a psychologist does. As a psychoanalyst, I do the same thing. I'm not particularly concerned with having an analyst on who's going to understand the process. I'm basically just there as a cold wall against which they can try their stupid fantasies and finally get rid of the fantasies and live in some kind of reality rather than the fantasy, right? That's what psychoanalysis does. That's what's similar to psychology. We also do narrative in the sense that we declare emergences and emergence vectors here. We, are, we, don't, we don't have to scientifically prove this, but if Greg, who is a scientist, can help give me as a philosopher strong arguments why mm -hmm. mind should qualify from a human perspective as a strong emergence that happened out of life, then I'm yep. all for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll make a, a couple of points uh, and uh, maybe I, I agree with Bart that the concept of consciousness is really, it's, it's, um, it's best probably to stay away from in general, although I am diving deep into it with, with John Verveke and we're untangling the various meanings, but it's very, very complicated. Um, the other thing I will say is in relationship to psychology, uh, the psycho I argue that actually the field straddles three different domains. It's part of its schizophrenic um, identity. One is what I call basic psychology, which is a pure natural science discipline, which is concerned with explaining animal behavior. Okay, um, that's what's basic. Then there's human psychology, which is the proper center of the field, which is a social science discipline, and then blurs between the natural sciences and humanities. And then finally, there's what I was actually trained as, which is the clinical psychologist, which is with the teenager, who I'm going to then try to construct an emergence of their narrative. And that's a totally different, that's, a, that's more my humanistic side, okay, with the analyst and the psychiatrist, where we're actually going to try to create helpful fictions uh, and sort around what would be most adaptive. And then my values and my way of being and the kind of metaphysical twists I might bring to bear on that. So I wear as a psychologist across domains, I wear, and I feel the field needs to divide because it's schizophrenic in terms of it's, it doesn't know what hat it's trying to wear and it doesn't appreciate the metaphysical implications of all those hats. Are you a natural scientist, social sciences, the humanities? That's why part of our field is so messed up. It doesn't have the right category. And that's why I appreciate you barred so much with your philosophy is getting clear about what it is that we're actually talking about. You know, and, and this is what you're doing is really a renaissance for the basic psychology. Mm -hmm. I right. think what happened mm -hmm. in the 20th century was that psychology became a field that power was attracted mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. and, and you had politi political power and you had commercial power that looked right. at psychology. And I think where it all went wrong is that it moved over to 
I would say it moved over to a fantasy the fourth category. And yep. you took the clinical psychology talk about that a psychologist you read. I mean, the psychologist is shamanistic and he serves the community mm-hmm. and he serves humanity. That's what mm-hmm. he does. He's like right. a replacement for the elders, hopefully more professional. Totally. Like, Secular priest, Thomas okay. Zaz called yes. us. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. But the problem was this. The, uh, the, 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 of course, state power saw psychology as a way to manipulate the voters or to manipulate the citizens. Okay, that was attractive. The worst forms, of course, was Nazism and Stalinism, where they really tried to control you. And then came Stasi in East Germany, whatever you want to call it afterwards. Sure. But actually, state power hasn't, it hasn't stopped there either. Mm-hmm. I mean, governments, uh, mass media, academia mm-hmm. have played together into controlling people's behavior. And psychology mm-hmm. was very much used by them to control people's behavior. Then the, the behavior control thing also moved into the commercial realm. And that's why you have these distortions like Facebook today. Totally. Because when Facebook employed psychologists, they employed psychologists to literally turn Facebook user in, users into addicts. Totally. In fact, that goes all, it goes all the way back to advertising. Actually, John Watson, the famous behaviorist who got nailed because he was in, involved in an affair, then left his post, I think it was John Hopkins, and then went into marketing and realized he's like, oh my gosh, if you pair a sex object with your car, you will get more associations Pavlovian. And actually, we psychologists that have been manipulating in consumeristic ways for over a century now, getting the triggers and big the, the, the stuff... Uh, uh, you know, the Tristan Harris stuff, a, a big algorithm, that's just big data applying what I call behavioral investment theory. Uh, behavioral investment theory is the foundation of mind. Um, but basically it says it's the ways in which your mind is calculating expenditure of energy to get return. It's all automatic um, in relationship to that. So, Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think this is this is like a shamanic turn. It's like the shamans are out in the forest. And when they do get an interest in humanity, they walk into the village and they try to cure people. Mm-hmm. Curatore, for example, as medicine starts there, uh, you know, supporting the elders when the elders can't figure out what's wrong with people, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, you know, curing, talking to the gods, talking to the strangers, talking to the outside world and, and preparing yourself for the next step in your life, preparing mm-hmm. yourself for adulthood, preparing yourself for maybe even divinity one day. You know, all those things are shamanic things for the shamans serve the community. The problem is that whenever you get somebody who takes over inside the community for the wrong reasons, they will go to the shamans and say, oh, you guys have tricks in your book. You, you can do things with people. You can manipulate mm. people. You can corrupt people with mm. your powers. And this mm-hmm. is the way that psychology betrayed its original cause by moving mm-hmm. upward from the basic psychology, which is really the mm-hmm. understanding of mind, where you should certainly mm-hmm. include animals and all life forms. That's the beauty of it. Where psychology is next to biology, is biology's twin. So it's like biology and psychology are twins, where it's just a shift from one emergence to the next. So it's basically life and mind studied in parallel as two twin mm-hmm. souls. That would be the wonderful thing if psychology was allowed to do that. But psychology mm-hmm. was kidnapped by people who thought psychology, they did the same thing with sociology and psychoanalysis too in the 20th century. If Freud mm-hmm. had seen what was done with psychoanalysis in Madison Avenue in the 1960s, and how psychoanalysis mm-hmm. moved into the marketing with the most cynical mm-hmm. reasons to try to manipulate people into buying more and more products and get more and mm-hmm. more addicted to commercialism, for example, then, then you would have seen the corruption of money and the manipulation of politics, again, try mm-hmm. to hijack both psychology and sociology and psychoanalysis. And this is essentially what we're working with today, is to turn that over with wisdom, to turn that over and expose it. And that's why I think it's a renaissance in the sense that we go back to the basics. That's what we try to do. Somebody's got a phone you got to turn off. <laughs> What's wrong with flight mode? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, right, actually, yeah. that's that's a hundred percent correct uh-huh. in the sense that um, the, in fact, in the history of American, uh, what happened was at, on the heels of World War II, uh, the Americans had a lot of money and a lot of people with adjustment problems, and they poured all the money in to turn psychologists into people that could solve adjustment, and that's when we became priests um, in the 1940s. Uh, we were scientists before then, uh, but then all then there was huge pressure to turn us into people that could help. Uh, other people adjust. Um, and, and then we never really figured out the proper relation between our natural science roots, our social science roots, and our humanities. And that's what I'm trying to offer as a renaissance. There is a way to get that r- r- right relation 
uh, and then to do so in a way that uh, enables us to make sense and to have the proper relation with the metaphysical seers like yourself who are, can understand where we are, what kind, where we might be going, what is our natures, and then bridge a scientific humanistic frame of understanding. That's what my hope yeah, is. Yeah, it, it's about systems. It's really mm -hmm. about systems. So, so for example, to, to even begin to try to understand psychology, or psychoanalysis, you first have to understand what systems are. You have to understand that you live within a system. It's called the, uh, the current ideology. There's right. always an idea of the society you live in that that society operates in a certain way for good or bad, right? So you've got a system and you've got to fight that system in the sense you've got to criticize it. You're going to be critical of it to understand who you are within that system. To even start that process, I think we need to deliver alternative systems for people to rethink this. And Completely. this is why we the way to build alternative systems, ironically, is not to go head on. It's actually to go to the roots of the previous system and expose what went wrong with it, and why it went wrong. Amen. Amen. That's why I, I admire you for going back to basic psychology in the sense that, well, it's a big psychology. I would call it big psychology mm -hmm. in the sense that it is the <laughs> psychology of all psyches. That's what the word psychology means. It's the logos of the psyche. It's the attempt at logically try to understand how psyche operates and what psyche mm -hmm. is. So, right. so th th that's, why, that's why I think what is deeply needed he here is your systemic theory and your systemic approach mm. to psychology. Yeah. And mm -hmm. hopefully that could be expanded into sociology eventually, but that's going to be fingers or difficult. I prefer to work with psychoanalysis and try to approach social analysis as, as the attempt to broaden that into the, totally. the social sphere and rather maybe even to look at the social sphere first, because mm -hmm. I never wanted to be psychoanalyst. I wanted to be socioanalysis. Right. I wanted to first understand tribe, social mm -hmm. context, because I think mm -hmm. we're deeply human, and then go back to the individual, as I say, the individual mm -hmm. human being to the try individual. to understand it. Right. But when you do psychology, of course, you're free, because you can do the psychology of polar bears. <laughs> polar bears yeah. are not social creatures. Their minds right. obviously are very solitary. They even mm -hmm. eat their own kids sometimes, you know, when <laughs> you know, which is quite right. admirable. Speaking of abortions, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, actually this may get back to what Andrew was saying about if you want to get into human consciousness, okay, and ideology, one of the connections that I made was this thing called justification systems theory. Okay, and the idea is, is as we talk and build propositions and engage in question answer dialogue, what emerges is a dynamic of justification. And that is when you think about what you are as a person and your self consciousness. So, Andrew, you were wondering about, well, what is self consciousness? It's that, that ability to self reflect on yourself. Hey, I'm here talking with Bard uh, and talking with you, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and also what we want to be really clear of, well, what are the ideologies? What are the paradigms? What are the things that we are, we are socialized into that we're told, oh, this is the right way of doing it. And this is what we're going to, this is what we have to learn. You have to dig right. in deep to those. And then you have to learn what the core systems of justification are. That's my term. And then mm -hmm. uh, I've got a frame on understanding how those things evolve, uh, which I can think help get. And why, I, when I listen to Bard's brilliant, narratives on ideology and where we are in relationship to that, uh, I can hear that in a particular light. So psychology has been extremely corrupted by, by ideology, right? And by commercialism and, and by all this thing. And, and your project is really to, 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 to bring it back to its, its empirical, scientific, but also, uh, also uh, a metaphysical uh, aspect instead of its commercial, cheap, American, you know, is that, am I getting yeah. that? Well, I, th I think that actually what it, the real root for me. So uh, uh, Bard rightfully nailed my limited philosophy as being stuck between Hume and Kant. Okay. So uh, the H Hume and Locke were empiricists and then Kant comes along and has a rational empiricist synthesis. Um, but really Kant is the real sort of, uh, the, the, what, what do you call him Bard? Sort of the obsessive autistic, but really analytic <laughs> guy who nails aspects of enlightenment. Okay. Uh, Hegel and other people, I think, uh, advance it in interesting ways. Um, but what I argue is that if you look at the Locke into Hume and uh, Galileo into Newton, okay, and then you take the knowledge systems that, that emerged out of there, you get what I call the enlightenment gap. Uh, and the enlightenment gap means that we didn't synthesize well, certainly not, I think the German idealists do it a lot better, okay, but certainly my empiricist angle from uh, that emerges from Britain into American, and then you get American empirical psychology, 
there's no good frame to understand the matter versus mind. Okay, so we don't have a good philosophical grammar for matter relative to mind. And we don't have clarity about what science is relative to social knowledge, like ideology. Okay, that's why you get a postmodern critique and the post-structuralists. Because you're too limited, there's massive limitations intellectually, you have an enlightenment gap and that gives rise to the problem of psychology, which is the inability to gain intellectual consensus on what it's about. Remember I said you get intellectual consensus around what okay. physics is and chemistry. And that okay. was one of my next question. Is there a danger in intellectual consensus when it comes to talking about the mind and creating too grand a vision like a, you know, I mean, you're creating a big, a big system and, and people yeah. and Ken Wilber created this big system and there's all these mm -hmm. big systems being created, but um, how but are you going to get everybody? No, no, how are you going to get everybody? Wait, 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 wait. I, I'm a system theorist. Let, let's put let's yeah. the point with the system is actually to make constraints. The point mm. of the system is to get out of the chaos and make order in the chaos. Mm, right, because it's so it's fragmented and, and crazy yes. psychology. The way, it, the way it works is this. What Greg and I try to do is that we try to remove ourselves as far as possible from what we're observing to try to see a bigger picture. Right. The bigger picture than, uh, oh, okay, that goes with that, and that right. goes with that, and there's no case. Actually, there's order to this, and mm -hmm. you see patterns, mm -hmm. and you create order out of that. But when you think of what giving order and exposing patterns in, in something you're observing, you're actually also adding constraints to it. That's mm -hmm. what systematization is. Sure. So actually, no, I think it's liberating to mm -hmm. systematize something so you can study properly. Psychology is suffering not only from the three categories that were split that Greg talks mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. are at least defensible, it also mm -hmm. suffers from the fact that two further categories that I would call corrupted psychology, which mm -hmm. is what money did, and manipulated mm -hmm. psychology, is what politicians did, need Completely. to get out of the way. We don't need any of those two. We don't need marketing people to you know, go inside right. psychology. And how do we kill that <laughs> enormous monster? It's like, we it's like, enlighten people and we yeah. expose them. So that's how you yeah. always do it. And yeah. basically, that's why I think the psychological renaissance that Greg personifies, there's such mm. a strong case for it that it comes from Greg who lives in America, I think is another good sign. But mm. what Greg pointed out, I want to go back to what Greg pointed out is that we have to remember that the hard problem of mind and matter, it's actually exposing that all emergence vectors start with the hard problem. So when we discuss an emergence and its irreducibility, mm -hmm. when we say right. irreducibility, we have accepted that it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's going to go soft suddenly. We can go into it and try to understand it. But here's the funny thing. Once you go into an historical emergence, like the difference between physics and chemistry, chemistry and biology, biology and psychology in this case, and eventually mm -hmm. psychology and culture, when you discuss the difference between these emergences, you discover that in e at each emergence, it has its own sets of habits and eventual laws and things. And all we can do now philosophically is that we can say that prior to the emergence, say prior to the beginning of life, there's an implicate order. Well, life does not yet exist. The potential for life always exists, mm. otherwise life would not suddenly occur. Right. We can discuss that and study that, and then we can decide that there's an implicate order that isn't life yet, but a potential to life, and then suddenly life occurs, and life is then the explication mm. of that process. And I'd like, from White and Bohm, I'd like to use implicate as the term we use prior to the emergence and explicate after. Mm. Alexander Red Ellen, the young Danish genius, helped me do this work, right? Interesting. So, mm -hmm. Because this, this, we can go back mm -hmm. to mind and matter. For example, but the classical mm -hmm. problem is that you see the color red. You hopefully right. your friend Greg or Andrew Alexander sees the same color you see. You can't be mm -hmm. sure of that, as Kant pointed out, which is mm -hmm. an artistic truth, to be honest about it. Who cares? But anyway. <laughs> As long as we agree on seeing the red collar in the same place. Some people care, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, God. Solipsist, solipsistic nerds. I'm so sick of that. I, I no. still have a little tie to Kant. So, uh, no, anyway, I'm, a, I I'm a pragmatist. I live life within life. That's what Amen, Hegel and the pragmatists did. So, yeah. anyway, uh, but the collar red, we know now for a fact from natural science that a certain wavelength at a light wave, hits the retina and the eye and stimulates it. And that is being interpreted by an intricate, fantastic system called mind into the color red. Now that's being described as a hard problem up until now. I would say that, well, the hard problem here is just is a, there's an implicate explanation and that is called the wavelength. And there's an explicate explanation called the color red. 
Mm. It's just that the two different ways of looking, it's like having a coin that has two different sides. Mm-hmm. Now, right. I think we have, uh, to me, I, I'm not really that eager to go beyond that because I'm not sure we can go beyond that. And we have to accept the fact because there is, if, we, if we have decided that there's an mm-hmm. irreducibility to the mm-hmm. color red that cannot be reduced to wavelength, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then we have made it a philosophical axiom that that mm-hmm. irreducibility is something we have accepted. So we can build mm-hmm. from it rather mm-hmm. than go back and you know, try to rehash it again, 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 as, mm-hmm. as if there was some mm-hmm. kind of solution to that problem. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> I don't know how you, I, I, how do you wreck to get a psychologist? Ah, brilliant. Yeah. So uh, what is a reusability in your worldview? What does that mean? Um, you know, the, the irreducibility to me uh, is I represent that the, the strong, what I call strong irreducibility. Okay. Which means that there is top down causation whereby to understand the cause effect sequence, you need the whole picture. You'll never go from the bottom up. Okay. And I believe that each one of, there are actually 12 specific layers that I emphasize in, you know, the periodic table of behavior, but four big ones, matter, life, mind, and culture. Okay. And I share that tree of knowledge system everywhere with those cones coming off of it. Okay. And that's supposed to convey the vision logic that culture doesn't go to mind, mind doesn't go to life, and life doesn't go to, mag- uh, to matter. And the issue is because there's this memory in many ways, memory and information processing that happens at cells, animals, and persons, okay, that there are good reasons to argue, and I can get into why the, the nature of causation is such that we would not want to suggest a, certainly any, any kind of simplistic reduction uh, that can, can, can be explanatory in relationship to those issues. So there's just no, um, there's no to me, it's, it's, a, it's a fantasy. It's a platonic little boy fantasy, um, that, to use some of the language, colorful language that you have given me, you know, that people wish for so that they could then say everything is determined uh, by one bounce into another bounce across scale. It's just wrong. Yeah, because these things go in loops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As soon as mind is there, it starts to affect life. We know right. it for a fact. Now we're about to destroy the planet because of our yeah. minds, because we've gone uh-huh. berserk, right? Uh-huh. So uh, these loops also mean there's so much information added in these loops all the time that it doesn't make any sense to speak of determinism or indeterminism. Mm-hmm. When, I, when I work with this, not philosophically, I would say that determinism and determinism are only local phenomena. Mm-hmm. For example, we know for a fact that you can have point A and you can have something to point B. And you can know for sure that it's going to go from point A and arrive at point B. You can even know when it's going to arrive at point B. But you can't know how it's going to arrive there because of probabilities, for example. That means that you can have indeterminate processes that go on in between determinate points. Mm-hmm. Hey, wait a second. What if just determinism and determinism are just remnants of an old world where we had predetermination? <laughs> and we know predetermination does not exist. We just actually have to trace now predetermination because we still have it everywhere in the world of philosophy. It's still there, a dirty laundry all over the place when it shouldn't be there. For example, mm-hmm. when you and I work on emergence vector theory together, we have these guys that come in and want to find general theories for emergences. Like if mm-hmm. There was some predetermined condition by some uh-huh. God out there, whatever, uh-huh. for what constitutes an emergence. And uh-huh. this is why we're so adamant saying, no, no, no. Emergences are something that we, in Hegelian way, as humans, only construct afterwards as necessities. Uh-huh. They were contingent when they happened uh-huh. so that we can make sense of the world. Uh-huh. That is why the world is always necessi- ne- There's a necessity to the world in the past because it looks like it was determined to arrive at the point uh-huh. where we're at. But we can only look at the future as something contingent that we cannot even guess where it's going, simply because of its enormous complexity. Not because there's an evil God out there who wants it to be indeterminate, or some nice God out there who who just set up a plan somewhere in some room that he's playing a game with us. No, (laughs) none of that is correct. That's why we talk about transdeterminism as a better way to understand how things actually operate. So emergencies can happen, but we only construct them afterwards. We are allowed to rewrite the narrative on when emergences happen. But we've agreed on this one condition that if we take the mind matter problem, or I would say the mind life problem. Mm. Yes, that's a better more frame. Yeah, yeah. That, that, those are the two emergences we're actually discussing. Mm-hmm. And the difference between mind and life, where is mind and in what way is mind irreducible to life? And why is that a beautiful thing? And why does therefore mind constitute its own emergence? Uh, and then we can look at where that happens and how that develops and proto-mind and whatever you like in life forms and things like that, which just makes it more fun. But 
if mind is irreducible to life, which I agree with you, you have strong scientific cases for that. I can then add philosophical cases for that. But if we then just say that that heart problem actually has taught us that we have the same similar heart problems with implicate and explicate orders at each emergence, mm. or we can then say that once an emergence has occurred, mm -hmm. we have an emergence vector, a vector coming out of that emergence. Mm. And that means all the life we at least see on this planet currently mm -hmm. is an emergence vector called life. Mm -hmm. We started that and it's called biology. This mm -hmm. is why the strong case here for psychology and the kind of work you do is that once mind exists, irreducible, mm -hmm. it merits its own discipline and the study of that mind right. is called psychology. Mm -hmm. This is what psychology should be. Yep. Amen. Uh, and, and, and my frame for then, then there's the metaphysical description, which you just delineated very clearly. There's a meta theoretical framework, which is called behavioral investment theory. Okay. Which is basically the argument is that you have an investment vector. <laughs> that, the, that the animal's expending energy toward particular kinds of outcomes given contingencies, both evolutionary and learning history. And then you can understand, create good scientific narratives about the dependent and independent variables you can experimentally analyze and tell a narrative about that, how that emergence happens. Okay, and then you go all the way from insects up to primates. Uh, and then there's a culture vector that gets lapped on top of that. Uh, and we see ideology explode and we get a culture person uh, vector on top of that. And then now all of a sudden you have a way, a taxonomy that classifies and clarifies life to mind to culture uh, and boom, uh, what was a lot of confusion uh, becomes a lot clearer. And with proper philosophical taxonomy, our, the possibility for scientific coherence goes much, much more dramatically. And I, I add here where Greg convinced me, uh, where I changed my mind. The only difference we had in the sort of higher level emergences here was that I worked with technology for years. And right. uh, I had a category of technology as separate from mind. Uh, basically because I work with, you know, humans are constant over time or probably mm -hmm. they get more stupid right. to be honest about it. So they, <laughs> they have a downward trajectory of the last 10,000 years. I study civilization, that's what I do. Totally. And, and machines have an upward right. trajectory, undeniably totally. so. Except, except for a few Mongol invasions where a few libraries were destroyed. <laughs> Information right. has been accumulated over the past 10,000 years. There are more and more drawing boards and more and more excellent drawings on them. And if we all die today, somebody would come along and would create a smartphone way faster than we did just by getting the drawings, Good. how you do it. 100%. Right? So mm -hmm. yesterday's magic is tomorrow's technology. That's right. Famous Bart Sadiq was saying. Okay. But mm -hmm. where I was convinced that this wasn't necessarily, because it was my love child, technology is my love child, it didn't necessarily merit as its own emergence. And when I was convinced that Greg's work, when psychology inspired me as a philosopher, was that Greg convinced me that, no, 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 go back here and see what culture truly is. And of course, culture to a philosopher fundamentally is what's not nature. Mm -hmm. Culture is what starts when the old woman cuts off the umbilical cord. So rather mm -hmm. than risk that nature kills the baby in the process of, you know, the matrix pushing mm -hmm. the baby out, mm -hmm. The old woman discovered that, no, I can get a pair of scissors, you know, from these guys mm -hmm. who do construction work, irrigation over there. <laughs> and boom, I can cut off the umbilical cord. And yeah, my little daughter here and her little child probably has a, you know, bigger chance of survival. Mm. We can call it feminine technology, if you like. Mm. So that is the origin of culture. Mm -hmm. The origin of culture is when we intrude into nature to do something that benefits us, hopefully. Mm. Sometimes not. Mm -hmm. It is called diabolical culture, but that's different. Yeah. So, but this, this idea that we can intrude into nature and tame and domesticate nature, including intrude and tame ourselves. And that mm -hmm. is the domestication right. of sexuality that's, fundamentally. That well, starts with sexuality, right? So, yeah, you, yeah. you got to tame so, I just want to ask a question because there's something I'm not yeah. very clear about. You, mm -hmm. you said that technology is a, a separate uh, vector. Uh, no, no, from, no, I have worked with that for which, years. Which I, I sort of I think that this is like a spider web. It's like uh, Greg's yeah. analogy of the spider web. It's like part of the spider. Yeah. That, so that it's an ex and Marshall McLuhan would say that technology mm -hmm. is, you know, an yeah. extension of the, the nervous system. And yeah. So. I, th I think technology is best described as when we do magic to impress mother. Mm -hmm. That's not mm. good enough when we marry. <laughs> then we got to turn that magic into technology, right. at least to impress the other guys. So, so you can impress your mother by making a magical trick, but you have to make it into a proper technology to impress the other men. That's what technology is. But what's fundamental here is how you define an emergence that's credible. Mm -hmm. And culture, by starting with the umbilical cord and cutting that off, mm -hmm. is cultural. It's much more defined as not nature. And in its mind is, of course, and because 
if you got an emergence vector between two other emergence vector, it's obviously the bridge in between the two. They might even develop in parallel, but it's obviously the bridge. Mind is then the bridge between life and culture. Right. Start to yeah. make sense of the culture nature divide that we all totally. struggle. With. So, so I, I agree. So um, I'll, offer, I'll offer, you know, my angle on that. The first thing I want to say is this thing I built called the tree of knowledge. That's the theory of knowledge tree behind me. But the tree of knowledge, the first branch on that thing, um, is not, is a map of natural, the natural world. It does not include material culture or technology. Okay. And Bard's absolutely correct. Let's be clear that there, there is an evolution of technology that's unbelievably important. And actually, <clears throat> I believe that there's a bending between culture and technology that's happening in the 21st century that's very new. That's called the digital. Okay. So the emergence of material culture, especially as it turns into a novel information processing communication system, there is an evolution of culture that's now fusing with us in a very bizarre way that's making the 21st century really, really interesting. Um, so for me, also to get to what Bard said about what culture is, I call it the culture person plane of existence, okay? That culture person plane of existence means that actually through self-conscious narration and the manipulation and what am I and what are you and what are we doing and how am I cutting the umbilical cord and how then that creates and the Bible you know, captures this in Genesis, it's a separation. It's awareness of, oh, what is good knowledge? What's evil knowledge? What is self-consciousness? We do separate ourselves and then we fall out of the paradise, paradise of a bliss, uh, you know, of our blindedness, become aware, but also become shamed about sex, uh, became, uh, and then all of a sudden we fall, you know, out of Eden and start building cultural myths uh, over the last 50,000 years. Um, and uh, that's a very, so for me, that's happening. We're building technologies uh, and that culture person plane is what's separating us from the animal kingdom. Yeah, and, and here what comes into the picture is that um, we are mind. Mm -hmm. This is Ma Mastein's Erastianism, as Erastian, Master, we are mind. Uh, it, it, it's our mind only. In, but mind it's only our prerogative, right? They can right. be proto-mind in other animals and we can enjoy them a lot, but we are mind, okay? It's called Master. So we personify Master. Uh, biology still has not been technologized. Mm -hmm. Although we're getting there very quickly and we're going to have synthetic biology very soon, right? So CRISPR. We, right, mm -hmm. Okay, CRISPR, for example. Yeah. But we're still working with life forms that we're taming. We're basically yep. domesticating life forms. And we've done that ever since we invented agriculture and cattle raising. So that's nothing new to that. Uh, but I think it's interesting to see the emergences because the, the question I'm working with, right, with Sodekvist is essentially this one. In about 30 years' time, some kind of machete intelligence will stand in front of us and ask us, who are you? And we better have an answer that has nothing to do with the machine. Amen to that, brother. Okay. Mm -hmm. The machines, as far as we know, work very, very efficiently at enormous speeds. Yep. With zeros and ones and the storage of the processing of zeros and ones. That is what digital is, is so far, right? Mm -hmm. It might be more than that. It might be some kind of synthetic biology where actually either we could, you know, if not if not create life, then at least develop life or tame life in ways we never thought we could do before. And we right. need to then redefine this again. We need to rewrite the map if that happens. But as things are right now, it's out of previous, this is funny because this is actually what Greg and I agree, but in the nice and sweet way. We disagree, he's just matter. When I say we matter, I do both subphysics and physics and chemistry. It doesn't matter here. The subphysics, physics, chemistry emerges. There's three of them in my theory. You just matter, and that's for you in psychology. Works perfectly fine, Greg. On the basis of that, it's out of matter. We do zeros and ones, and it's called silicon, and then we add electricity to that. That's matter, yep. and we put it at fast speed. Yep. That is digital so far. And out of that, I would say, this is why it's interesting to, to understand meta-narratives. And I would say we have three of them. And the three narratives are logos, mythos, and pathos. Nice. And we tend uh, to always focus on logos and mythos. Yes. And what's interesting with pathos that we always try to hide, and it comes back to haunt us all. <laughs> yeah, mm. it's called sexuality. Every time somebody asks me, yeah, I know what a mythical narrative is, and I know what a logical narrative is. A logical narrative is essentially anything that's similar to mathematics or tries to be mathematics. And then, of course, science tries to be that, right? And yep. then uh, a mythical narrative is a good Netflix series or something like that. It's a story about ourselves one way or the other. It doesn't have to be true because the mm -hmm. truth lies in its heart. It li doesn't mm -hmm. lie in its, in its re re retelling of facts, mm -hmm. right? 
right? Mm -hmm. So this is, of course, science, and this is, of course, storytelling. So we have those two, but we were obsessed with those two, and we constantly forget about pathos. Mm -hmm. When a reality like pathos is so important, is that now that's the one we need to go for because we cannot, we will not ever see a machine going pathical. Right. <laughs> and, and the way I describe my people ask me, what is a pathical narrative? We don't tell pathical narratives. That, well, last time I checked, pornography took up 30% of all the broadband in the world. So, you know, if 30% <laughs> of Wi-Fi is obsessed with pathical narrative, that's exactly why you cannot turn mm. pornography into acting and you can't mm. turn theater into pornography because mm. it doesn't make any sense. It gets weird mm. and strange. You're not mm. supposed to fuck in mm -hmm. a movie and you're not supposed to try to turn a pornographic movie into a movie because it mm. gets silly. No, mm -hmm. that's exactly because the pathical and the mythical may not, they may not meet. You can only mm. play with the pathical and the mythical because if you actually expose the pathical, you destroy the drama instantly. Mm. This mm. is the nature of pathos. Nathos, pathos is when everything is fantastic in your life. You walk out the door and, 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 and lightning hits you and you're dead. <laughs> and all the fun's over. It's just right. Pathos mm -hmm. is that the real in, in psychoanalysis. Is that pathos pathos is, is sex and death, right? As, as, as sort of speak it's or... sex, it's death, it's violence. It, right. yeah, it's mm -hmm. often it's mm -hmm. what really good theater tries to expose in the sense that anything you don't... Well, want that's what I'm a bit confused about because you said that theater can't really deal with those themes, but I would think that a theater without pathos would be very bland or, or yeah no doesn't... shakespeare does it okay but remember this it, it theater and pornography separate those but they're both pathical it, what i mean is this that pathos is essentially anything you don't worry children close to mm. so uh mm -hmm. you you don't you don't want to do a documentary about an abortion clinic in detail and show it to your children do you I mean, it's at the, not, not even to grown-ups would you do that, right? Uh, so, you know, if there's a story you don't even want to tell the grown-ups, you should just keep it to the gods, right? Mm -hmm. This is the level at which we actually have to understand what pathos is. So pathos, at, at the ultimate pathos, is that which is so terrifying, not even we as humans can handle it. Mm. And you and I talk a lot about tantra in our work, Andrew, and Tantra is what you can only do when you're ready for it because you've got to stay in the sutra and do not even expect grown-ups, even if they're wonderful grown-ups and you've got great grandfathers and grandmothers besides being parents in their lives, do not expect them to be able to handle Tantra because Tantra is like, that is only for those who can actually handle it and they will freak out anyway. Uh -huh. So it's just, it, it, that, I think those distinctions are very important in our culture to do that. Uh -huh. And I think this, this is where maybe the kind of work I do could actually serve psychology eventually too, because. Oh, I, absolutely. So for, yeah, right. For me learning those, uh, you know, I, I've had, I, I was impaired. I just had sciences and humanities. Okay. A much more narrative effect, richer narrative is the logos, you know, the task of science, the task of the day, get clear and accurate. The mythos, the dawn, that we tell ourselves the fundamental stories and archetypes and then the pathos the elements of night but also the ideographic emotional sex aggression core of the individual right and and at the unique uh, soul of each unique individual from the inside that, that that allows for a particular type and so i love the mythos logos and pathos and i actually love to tie it together you talked about where are we going to go the ethos you know we ultimately also need to kind of keep certain kinds of notions in mind uh, in relationship to making ethical, wise, intelligent decisions at some level. Um, yeah. So but that, we that, cultivate... comes, that comes as a byproduct just, of violence. Eight can I just interrupt violence. quickly? We're yeah. just just yeah. to tell you guys that we're moving up to like the 10 o'clock mark uh, where, I, where right. I normally I would open things up to the audience. So do you guys want to just, um, do you guys want to just say a few final things before we open it up uh, to the, uh, the audience for, for Q&A? Sure. I'll, just, I'll, I'll summarize. I, I thank, thanks, Bart, a lot of, you know, for your insights. Um, I'm glad. I do feel like uh, our vector systems emerge. I, I will say, you know, in my more fine-grained analysis, I do differentiate particle subphysics into atomic, into chemical, you know, uh, and then I have more fine-grained analyses. Um, so I think we actually even align more closely with that. Um, I think we're also really aligned in the artistic psychoanalysis, which gives, and socioanalysis, which gives rise to a proper metaphysics of the future, or at least way of reflecting on that and that's got to be anchored to a logos of the past and my attempt at the scientific renaissance of psychology i think plugs us and creates a bridge between us that i'm barely really excited and been, that is the logo that is the logo so just to just to clarify this to make it very very simple john favarica sort of made the point that this is absolutely it's actually not correct but okay but in, in 
the easiest way to try to understand these three narratives is to understand you've got two hemispheres in your brain, two halves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And understand one of them as logos. It tries at least to go for logos and the other one is mm -hmm. going for pathos, okay? Mm -hmm. You would do fine if it's just going to be a lion surviving on the savannah with all those two probably, right? But when we are social creatures and we have language and access to language and that actually turns out to be beneficial for our own survival. Mm -hmm. Mythos is simply the, the vain attempt of trying to unify logos and pathos. Mm -hmm. So what we're working on right now in our philosophy is to say that instead of stopping at intelligence, which is ridiculous, we should go towards transcendence. Because mm -hmm. intelligence is what machines will do fantastically. They will do logos right. fantastically. So, but they will not really? do pathos. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think it's adamant that Pathos must not be removed from logos or logos from pathos. The only good mythos, and we're trying to create good mythos here, right? You do when you go to see your patients. I go when I go mm -hmm. see my adolescents. We go to, we'll go to see our students. We go when we go from the tantric to the sutric to try to teach people how to live a life accordingly. And we, we learn from the people we talk to. Absolutely. Because we're in the same process ourselves. Mm -hmm. We go through that process. It's adamant here. And you've got to watch out for guys like me. If psychoanalysis, I try to save psychoanalysis from the same forces of the corruption of money and, mm -hmm. and the manipulation of politics as you do with psychology, it's less attacked, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. And I think social analysis, thankfully, is a new baby we're giving birth to. I think Slava Shishik opened the door and guys like me are working with it now. Kind mm -hmm. of last and others are doing it precisely that. But social analysis is just taking psychoanalysis, try to understand the social by not attempting to call it sociology. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the biggest crisis of all is the one in sociology. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. it's totally fucked up. It's totally no. <laughs> fucked up. It's so bad. I mean, all the woke shit that's going on at the moment, that came out of the sociology departments of Thaddeus Ross is at war with it. Douglas Rushkov is at war with it. You, you and I, Greg, are at war with it. We're all at war with the sociology departments of Europe and North America because they are really pathologically sick. They need psychological emergency care. <laughs> but I think what is important here is that the logos here, the psychology and the sociology here are incredibly important to complement the psychoanalysis and the social analysis. But it, because if you look at the art here, the shamanic mm -hmm. art of psychoanalysis and social analysis, it's very much in the pathic. That's exactly why I am a philosopher who's a psychoanalyst who writes about pathos and defending pathos against logos. Wow. And Whereas wow. you go into redefining, reconstructing logos properly as it should be in a right. psychological renaissance. But at the end of the day, if, if our social analytical perspective on society as well, it's not complemented by true science that actually does mm -hmm. science properly to understand mm -hmm. how a society works. So find right. his sociology comes to wake up. I think further down the line, 30 to 50 years from now, we're going to need a major sociological renaissance too, to fit in the whole quadrant of psychology, sociology, and psychoanalysis and social analysis. My, uh, yeah, otherwise, my we can't understand humans mm -hmm. and we can't understand society. Right. My mentor is a sociologist, uh, Joe, Joe Mikulski, and, and we were just actually just talking absolutely about essentially all of that and his um, vision of how he could build off the tree of knowledge and then apply it to his discipline of sociology and begin to bring in some order uh, to that chaos. Because you're absolutely right. Yeah, and but, I'll, don't, I'll, but don't rush it. Don't rush it, Greg. There's, there's mm -hmm. a don't rush no, it. you're absolutely right. There's great no, work. You, it's so uh, no, um, uh, yeah, no. Detailed. That's not my, that's not my, that's him and he can do it and we'll work together. But I will also, let me also say that uh, the bridging that we get, that you and I do, I think is very interesting in relationship. So I bridge, I'm both a scientist, theoretical scientist, and I'm a therapist, right? And you're doing both philosophy and socioanalysis, right? And so we can both, we're both sort of bridging between philosophy and science and therapy and healing, right? Um, and I think that that, that intersection of clinical uh, work and the narrative healing myths that we engage in in our work allows us um, that flexibility to see where each one is another nice intersection point between us. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. great. Uh, guys, so I've, I've invited uh, everybody to be a panelist, which means um, people are welcome to turn on their video camera just so we can see your faces. Um, and if you have a question to, to uh, unmute yourself. Um, I've got one question from Felix, Felix Bergman. Do you, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question or, or would you prefer that I read it from the, the chat? You can read it. So, so in case people want to podcast, listen to this, they can do so. So don't, don't, uh, 
Don't 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 take it for granted. Anybody's watching. Just just just. <laughs> well, Felix is there. I know Felix is there. He just wrote it. Uh, and Felix asked, "Is it part of the mind to to be consciously ashamed of pathos?" Hmm. Well, okay. Part of the mind to be ashamed. Well, I I'm not sure shame necessarily has to be part of mind at all. I think shame is a social thing. What do you say, uh, Greg? Uh, yeah, for me, the uh, there. So, if uh, you you track the development of behavioral investment, now shame's complicated, okay? Because it does require many people consider it a self conscious emotion, meaning I have to self reflect and then judge myself negatively. Um, so there's big debate as to whether or not uh, other animals and to what extent other animals experience shame. I, I believe that it's a pretty clear precursor. Um, for animals to experience sh sh deferential defeat and inferiority um, and to signal submission and to go and hide after uh, pain along those lines and have a cluster of uh, you're better than I am feelings. Uh, now, humans narrate that with what's called character logical shame, and that gets into then the self-conscious cultural ideological element. Um, so that it depends on whether you def uh, define that as essential uh, to the emotional narrative of shame. If you do, then yes, it's more of a cultural self-reflection. If, however, you get at the phenomenological core of defeat and inferiority um, and even self-contempt, a felt of sense of weakness, um, I think that you can see that operate at the phenomenological uh, primate level. I would say that shame is something we see in animals because if you see two chihuahua dogs fucking and you stare at them, they will go and hide somewhere and start fucking there instead. Mm -hmm. Just like teenagers do with parents are so, looking. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so shame is definitely instinct. And instinct is what we share with animals in the world of psychoanalysis. Uh, but it doesn't mean... It, it, I've met people who overcome shame and live completely unashamed lives. That, that's also uh -huh. an enlightenment process you could work with. Sure, so absolutely. It, it, I mean... Some people love to be ashamed all the time. Some get pleasure out of it for all I care. But in general speaking, at least in my practice with psychoanalysis, I try to just show the banality of shame to people. It's an instinct. It has certain purposes. But just because it's essential or shared with animals doesn't mean you have to live within shame. You can live a very shameless life. And if you live with some Nietzsche and edits, that's probably towards where you're headed. Yeah. All right. I do think that in psychotherapy, a very core a lot of good evidence for this is, is a core under subconscious, somewhat conscious, um, characterological shame, like I'm not worthy, a fear that I'm not good enough, uh, is at the root of a lot of suffering. And, yeah. and certainly it comes up very, very regularly in therapy. And this is what we call superego versus ego in psychoanalysis. It's the same thing. They're parallel. Right. Just different Absolutely. vocabularies. Yeah. Right, right. You we internalize had, the uh, judgment. The superego and, and, uh, gives you shame. Yeah. And, and the, the superego yeah. is you internalize the standard and you're not good enough and you're afraid that you will be judged for it. And so you preemptively defer and then internalize that failure. And then that judgmental part gets solidified as part of your psyche. And it's very, very... Uh, it's pretty brutal for those that have it strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else uh, w would like to, to just jump in here? I got, uh, I got a good comment from Mera Noga. Mera, oh, you got a Mera. comment. How come I'm not getting comments? Okay. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. It, it's a bit flattering to me, but I'll read it for you. To me, Bart is trying to understand the physical emergence of the Lord or the mind being. This is what we're clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mind being. By reconstructing its body through the root of the phallus. Okay. Yeah, correct. His mind phallus interaction back and forth reminds me of the chicken egg problem, but not quietly, quietly. He understands how a God creates himself as a life form. He's a true religious man. Well, thank you. Yes, I hope so. Yes, this is a deep theological question. Uh, to just make it simple, I would say that God is a relation and God is the relation between human beings. So, I start with that God concept. Mm -hmm. God is also the name for what we possibly could create in the future because we have no other name for it. Um, and I, I would sort of challenge all of you out there by saying that, unfortunately, in Western philosophy in the last 100 years, we made God something that created us and we're supposed to aspire towards communism at the end of the day. <laughs> Actually, historically speaking, we should have turned the other way around. We left communism because tribes operate according to communist principles. Everybody shares everything. And then we aspire towards God. So I would try to just reverse the order and say, yeah, we started with communism and going towards God. And if communism ever returns, it's probably as a very elitist project for a chosen few. Now, how's mm. that for you as Marxism? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I, yes, I, chicken egg problem. Yes, it is. 
I think because it is relational, what is fundamental in Zoroastrianism, which I admire, is that it leaves you hanging in the air between Aura and Masta. And that's when it gets interesting concerning our discussion here, because Aura is, 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 um, is being and Masta is sense. That is actually identical to life and mind. So the Zoroastrians 4,000 years ago decided that if there was a God, the God must both have being and have mind, but because it had being in mind, why not stay within the dialectical between the two? Mm. And that's exactly what the Zoroastrians invented tolerance <laughs> because, mm. because it was an internal split within the divine. They could then apply that on the tribe by saying that the priest must not be the king and the king must not be the priest. Right. And this is the primordial division. By dividing priest and king, it's called Shah and Shah, the king of the kings, and Mobed and Mobed, the priest and the priest, must have separate courts, separate capitals, must never meet. The Mobed must not reproduce, be you leave that to the king, but the king must not reproduce ideas because they leave the reproduction of ideas to the priest. So we leave the re reproduction of ideas of mind to the mind, and we leave the reproduction of biology of life itself to the king. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This division with your life and mind, I think, is primary. And this is where you run into the problem with Taoism in China, which I love. But Taoism has mm -hmm. the problem that they go all the way for the masculine-feminine divide. But I mm -hmm. would say the masculine-feminine divide is secondary. Because when the tribe is on the move, the first thing you need is fucking leadership. And that's mm. why I always say that religion is for men. And women couldn't care less because women basically are interested in the results of the religion. Mm. They're interested in shoes and babies and diapers and, you know, and for good reason. That's not a but, controversial statement. Yeah, they're trying, to, they're trying to force men into believing in shoes too and always tell them, don't try to turn us all gay because it's for the gay guys. Gay guys do fashion better than we do. Straight guys are horrible at things like fashion. They're, you know what? Straight guys are even horrible at hierarchy. They're even horrible at understanding intrigue. Straight guys mm -hmm. can only understand vertical and horizontal. They cannot understand when somebody looks down on you from the side. Only women and gay guys can survive that. And this is so interesting when you start looking at these things and you can admire the strength of the feminine and also understand the mm -hmm. masculine. But why I'm saying that is that the division here between mind and being, therefore between life and mind, as we discussed it here, is the fundamental division we understand as human beings in our relationship to the outside world, to the animal world, to the plant world and everything. And all this. Because it's just, it's just for the guys who are gonna walk first. And then it's like the Supreme Court that judges whether the guys are fictitious. That's the yin. Mm. The yang is split mm. and the yin is in the back. And this is the problem with Taoism, that Taoism does not understand the yang must be split for the system to work, which opened up Chinese culture to Confucianism that has then sort of desperately tried to fill that gap, which is why China is still having dictatorships and problems with not understanding the beauty of plurality and things like that, because Confucianism is just stringent bureaucracy, one system, you know, all the way up to the top and one little pharaoh at the top. That's essentially very Egyptian. That's what Chinese systems are. And that's Confucianism. And I, I, they wouldn't have had Confucianism. It wouldn't have existed in China unless it was for Taoism's failure to understanding the fundamental separation of life and mind. Mm. I think that's what Mera was getting at. So, yeah. Mm. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom, are you there? Tom Marmack? Are you sure. around? <clears throat> sure, I'm here, of course. Do you want to show your face as, as the... the <laughs> In our, this crowd. The, our, our friend in, of Parallax? Uh, sure, but you have stopped the video, so I can't activate it from here. You can't activate the video. Okay, uh, that must be the reason. I don't know how I've done that, but... Um, well, this is weird. Mr. Parallax himself. So he's I'm making you the host. How about that? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm I'm a host again. Okay. Perfect. Can you put Can you put on the video now? Yes, of course. Fuck. Yeah. Okay. We got to figure this shit yeah, out. We, Sorry, we still guys. have to figure that out. How that all works. <laughs> yes. Great. Uh... Great talk, man. Good. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Fascinating f subject. That's for sure. I'm always wondering, like, uh, what is it about the psyche? Mm. Yeah. We're, st it's we're still like, it's still like, we're like cats circling around it. It's just, we haven't really talked about psyche. We talked about the conditions for psyche and the study. Right. Of psyche. Uh, because we have to, because we have to. These um, days. I mean, you know, for me, the, you know, Aristotle is really, that's the term. Uh, the, the term comes from soul and psyche. 
Uh, and it's for me, Aristotle's captures the functional form at the level first of life. That's what he actually means it as sort of vegetative psyche. There's a vegetative psyche. And what he means there is that there's a functional form of reproduction, okay, and metabolism that you see in plants. Now, of course, Aristotle didn't know really about cells, but he knew about plants and they reproduced and they grew and they metabolized. And that was the vegetative level of psyche. And then there was the level of the animal or animus or um, the sensory motor psyche. Okay, now that gets into the sensory experience and then action that makes animal behavior so much you different, uh, both from the inside so that you can have experience potentially. Uh, you know, I, plants have proto experience, but pleasure, pain kinds of real experience begin to emerge, I think, at the sensory motor. And then it's the functional form of that sensory motor existence. That to me is the base of, psycho of what should have been the science of psychology, because actually the vegetative really gets taken over by biology. Okay. Then you have basic animal psychology happening at that sensory motor behavioral pattern. Okay. And then there's finally the rational psyche, the rational psyche of the narrating, talking, reasoning animal, what we're doing right now, engaged in self-reflective narration, uh, connecting to ideology, thinking about the world. Okay, so you really get a biopsychosocial functional form analysis, um, and then we could hone in on the middle of that, the core of that, that animal soul, and then you can actually define the base of psychology that way. Right. So I don't know, Greg, how, how uh, familiar you are with, with uh, systems theory and Maturana and, and, and Luhmann, sure. because he, he um, wrote a l very nice little article essay about the autopoiesis of consciousness. And yep. so his basic premise was that there is some kind of observer and, you know, he, he works with this basic notions yep. of um, distinguishing and denoting, mm -hmm. I, th I think, if I might... Uh, mm -hmm. correctly and so so what you said about the emergence um that was something that resonated with, with me because if you apply system theory and autopoiesis it's like how the system starts to think about autopoiesis in various levels about itself so you have like this animal kingdom and basic physiological mm -hmm. uh, observance without denoting mm -hmm. just making distinctions instinct and mm -hmm. I, i want to eat this i don't i want to mate with that Mm -hmm. And then in comes an emergence where you start to observe and, you know, denote what's what, basically. Mm -hmm. so that's like the rational mind, in, mm -hmm. I would presume, in your, in, in your understanding. And so at one point, there's another emergence where you can uh, distinguish and denote the relationship between what you're observing and denoting. Kind, kind of, it's, it's a little bit um, long ago since I read that, but I found it quite mm -hmm. interesting in that. In that yeah. Um, there's definitely there's definitely different levels uh, and they feed back on each other. Right. So you're tracing that. Okay. Um, so I, I identify three very clear levels in the animal world. So before human. So one is a reactive and reflexive level. I mean, like reflexes, not reflexive like that. But right. Reflex. Okay. And then there is a learning motivational level. Okay. Um, and this is when an animal is engaged in feedback with its environment, whether it's having reinforcement or punishment. The basic is what's called Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, that's when you're just basically getting an association to habituate and sensitize. Okay, then you get much more complicated dynamic um, uh, interaction. And then you get animal deliberation. That's when an animal will simulate possible paths of investment. Okay, have much more of an episodic sense of self, an internal observer, and will track what it's doing. And then you get higher and higher sophistication level of that. And then you finally get on the human layer on top of all that. You get a talking layer. And then you get talking mirroring. And then you get the evolution of culture. And then all of a sudden, now we right. can really start to parse where we are across time and all the way back to the Big Bang and out to the end of the 21st century, you know, right. and, and do that kind of thing. Yeah, but yeah, that's way more uh, differentiated. But the, the interesting, the thing that interests me the most is like how, when we start to think about autopoiesis in itself of culture of consciousness and you know mm -hmm. because that's an evolutionary feat in itself yeah absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely we got a good question here that really fits in with this it's from Aaron, mm -hmm. and, and and he's concerned here what does it mean to focus on mind rather than consciousness what's the yeah. practical implication of thinking mind instead of thinking consciousness uh yeah. that that is a good question for, for me okay as a philosopher speaking here 
we call it the mind matter problem. We don't call it the consciousness matter problem because mind is a huge, fantastic thing to explore. And we've agreed that it's irreducible to life. So mm-hmm. that's the thing to study. And, and I just think it's a bit boring. Just think of how you, your own consciousness operates and just think of subconsciousness, which is when you're not conscious about what you're doing, essentially. It goes in and out of, you, you, you're aware of certain things that you're conscious about them. You're not aware of them. They're subconscious to you. And you know, most of the fun things in life are subconscious. Somebody cracks a joke, you start laughing. You're only conscious of the fact that it was funny. You had a laugh until after it happened. Subconscious Mm -hmm. mind is fantastic. It's huge. It's intricate. It's there to be studied. That's what psychology does. But as far as consciousness, I would say consciousness was a Western obsession that came out of individualism and the idea that the state could control its citizens by turning them into individuals and holding them individually responsible for everything they did. So it's really, if you think about the history of consciousness, it's really something that's been thrown at us and put on us to hold us responsible. We are. You were conscious of what you just did, is what the judge says to you when they sentence you into court. Because hmm. if you weren't conscious of it, they can't sentence you. So there's no way to tax you. There's no way to control you. There's no way to, you know, there's no way to, 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 to stop you doing from what you want to do. There's no way to do that unless you actually have a mythos of a consciousness here. But I think that is actually not that constructive. I think it's much better to look at the mind as, 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 as the thing to study. That's my, yeah. What do you say, Greg? And Tom, do you so, have something to add to that? Why yeah. mind over consciousness? Or maybe so, the opposite. I don't know. No, it's definitely, for me, it's definitely mind. But there is a meaningful way to talk about consciousness as a subset of mental process. But you have to be careful about it. So for me, actually, there are three different domains of mental process, okay? One is the neurocognitive functional domain that involves overt action, okay? In other words, there's the neuroinformation processing that allows you, that allows my fish over there to swim around, okay? So that's one domain, neuro, and then we divide it up into actually two subdomains. One is on the outside, that's mediated by muscles, and the other is on the inside, that's the activity of the nervous system, and it's hierarchical nervous system processing, what we call neurocognition. No consciousness necessary, and we can build models of neurocognition that help explain how the overt action is a function of its developmental history and new variables that are exposed to. Okay, And that's what I call functional awareness and response, which is observed from the outside. In other words, as a scientist, I can see what my fish are functionally aware of. If I sprinkle food up there, they come swimming up to it and engage in functional awareness and response from the outside. Okay, Then there's from the inside. Now, that's, that's phenomenology okay? or first-person conscious experience. All right? Now, that's a huge problem because you can't, that's the gap of redness. How can I know that my fish experience red at all or experience the taste of the food? You actually really don't. They're getting models over it. I think consciousness experience goes pretty deep in the animal kingdom, but we can talk about that. But that's what I call mind two, okay? Mind two is when you're talking about that experiential domain, all right? And then where that is in the animal kingdom, that's great. I'm certain it's in crows and above and, and many, many primates and dogs, whether it's in fish, whether it might even be in insects, that's a good question. And then finally, there's what I call mind three, which is what you're listening to right now. You're listening to me justify, okay? And mind three also has an inside. That's just when I talk to myself and an outside when I publicly share, okay? So that's a, to me, that's a much better mind. It's much more comprehensive. And if we divide it up into mind one, neurocognition that mani- mediates your over procedural action, Mind two, behind the eyes, phenomenology, and mind three, justification private and then public, then you can actually get a good metaphysical description of the domains and clarify the relationship between mind and consciousness and self-consciousness, by the way. And these sort of, but not exactly, match when we go from pathos to logos to mythos. Like, yeah. you know, we can't be careful. Yeah, Greg and I would agree that you be careful with those, but, but the, sort of, the, the reason why there's three and why we're looking at three different ways of doing narrative as well. Because it's sort of late to all three. When you look, when you sort of look in hindsight, how you actually constructed those three. But when when we say pathos, logos, and mythos, it's just because there happens to be the three ways we do narrative. Right. The, that, the way that's, I, that's a yeah. sociological fact mm-hmm. or nothing. Else. Right. The way I would look at it is so that when you're behaving as an animals, don't really have any mythos. Okay. They have to discern the logic of what's out here, and they have to discern. Then they'll generate a pathic response, which is the energy that they're going to move toward. So you have a logos and pathos sort of relation. 
Then we get up into language, and then Logos turns it into the logic of the day, which is exemplified by science. And then we have to build mythos that tells us what matters and what meaningful is. And that's as a, that whole cultural mythos narrative and why they humans draw you know, weird animal humans in caves and 40,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, that mythos is a, is a new justification dimension uh, that emerges out of our yeah. way of being. That's a great way of describing it, Greg. Great. So how about Tom? I mean, you're, are you a consciousness fan? <laughs> Do you feel we, we, we're belittling your favorite topic or something like that? No, 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 no. of course not. But I, but I am a chat fan. Has, here's Jake Ruiz who has a question. Andrew, do you want to read that? Or? Sure. Um, where do personality types, archetypes fit into your conception of mind? Um, okay. Yeah. The question is about archetypes. Sure, okay. I can. Yeah, we're developing something called archetypology even so we can mm -hmm. separate and have the studies mm -hmm. of archetypes. And I don't mean archetypes in the Jungian sense. I actually mean in the classical sense prior to Jung. Archetypes, mm -hmm. are, yeah, personality traits, for example, could be a good example of that. It could be more than that, though, way more than personalities. But essentially, these are the forms that operates in the human mind when we sort of tribally and socially try to orientate ourselves in the world. The reason why I love to work with archetypes is because I can get rid of all the Platonist forms once and for all. It's like, no, <laughs> the world is not about geometry. Mathematics is about geometry, not the world that we live in. No, the archetypes are not predetermined by some God. The archetypes have been developed over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years within tribal creatures like human beings. And eventually we come to Homo sapiens over the last 200,000 years. The archetypes are developed over a long period called the Socion, which lasts over 70,000 years. So the different types of men and women, those are different types of androgynous people and different types of shamanoid characters in there. What we did in Digital Liberty was we essentially started to make a map called the tribal map. And tribal mapping is something we can do now and never been able to do before because we can scientifically do it through something called data anthropology. Anthropology being related here to what Greg works, which is called psychology. So in the world of anthropology, now with data, we can map and, and because of that, we can start to make a map over people and we can then tie it to the classical archetypes so we can help people guide themselves in the world of social psychology to what kind of personalities they are and what they should specialize on, for example. That's what we work with in archetypes. And, and of course, oh. the different archetypes are different minds. Mm -hmm. They operate differently. That's what we can study in psychology. Uh, so for me, there's... Two, I, one of the things that I would want to differentiate, um, when you say personality types, it makes me wonder if you're thinking about personality traits, okay? So that's a whole nother uh, class, in, at least in, if now you get into personality science psychology, um, there are dispositional trait tendencies, and I can explain what I mean by those and what, what those are. Um, and then there are sort of the archetype, and archetype refers to a particular uh, self other relational element and i would argue that we are we have an architecture of what's called the relationship system that is framed in classic self other frames okay and what i mean by that a classic self other frame is like a high relational value frame that's when you're known and loved uh and and if you recall you go back to your history and it's like what do you really remember it's like i remember when i got the job or i remember when i did this and my parents loved me right and then I ask you, well, what are some of the most painful things? And you're, oh, I remember when I was rejected. I remember when I failed. Um, and there'll be themes, uh, uh, both of, that's sort of the core. And then there are power themes, love themes, freedom themes. Okay. These are process dimensions. And what we see in the old stories, the Jungian archetypes, are really these classic self-other relations in developmental history across certain kinds of plot themes that then the hero archetype, uh, the evil queen archetype, uh, and those, those are classic themes, self-other themes around particular kinds of travels and travails and triumphs um, that repeat themselves over and over again. And they speak to us because we have this internal working model architecture of power, love, and freedom. Uh, and that's why it spreads across the ages. So archetypes and personality traits, they're somewhat different. They're related, um, but those are the ways the, uh, the unified theory yeah. uh, sorts them. This is why I said I, I'm not doing doing an archetypes in our work. We're doing archetypology, right. the classical archetypology. And archetypology yeah. essentially is, for example, uh, say you're a young man and you want to have a mentor. Uh, you, you want somebody to guide you. Look for somebody who has your traits and has successfully pursued those. 
So you, you, you stay within your, within your archetype. That's when the archetype becomes personal, for example. Archetype mm -hmm. could also be today, for example, if you go online, you will have an instinct towards finding tribal belonging somewhere. Mm -hmm. That tribe used to be in the 150 to up to 1,200 people that you were surrounded with when you were born in the past. And that was the world. Anything else outside of that would be a threat to your survival. Uh, yeah. These days, you might go for finding 150 people you can associate with and stay with and stay loyal to online and you create a digital subculture and maybe then you can meet the physical space and, 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 you know, and create a community out of that. This is what I would say you would, should do today with your tribal instinct because subcultures today are tribes coming back again. Mm -hmm. So we created what we call digital tribes and, and, mm -hmm. and, and these digital tribes, again, that's an archetype. Look for the tribe that you share interest with. You, you, mm -hmm. you just, don't, just don't go for anything that's a major challenge. Go for that which is easy for you to do, but that other people admire you. And this is an archetype. That's how we describe it as an archetype. So we, nice. we talk about this as archetypology and the sort of social work that we do for people to guide them through life. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick off that's of that. That's a social archetypology rather than a personal, like a, like a Jungian archetypology. Which no, no, like, Jungian archetypes are also are, social. Of, These are all social. All the things. Yeah, but it's, it's more about individuation and, and, and so, on some level, uh, it seems to me, like mm -hmm. Jung. No, no. When Jung says individuation, that exactly because we don't use the word individual we used to any longer, you get problematic. Jung really means dividuation. He means yeah. that you find your specific role within the tribal context. Jung has, mm. there's no guy, there's no solitary, there's no Ubermensch in Jung. There's, there's no solitary guy who goes off there and proves to the world that I but can But he talks about alone, the right? soul. He talks about the, the unique soul unique of each person. I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking about Jung. He I'm also talks correct. about the collective no. unconsciousness or subconsciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jung is a very deeply social thinker and, and, and uh, he's very mythical, to be honest also. But I, I would say what I'm saying archetypes here is that we cannot just stay with the Jungian archetypes. Jung did mm. hijack the word, but that's not the only way you use the definition. Archetypes have been used since you know, ancient times to try to discover patterns. And these patterns are about you and your role within a tribe, or also the tribe has certain patterns and you have certain patterns, and you try to match them. Etc. Mm. So that's why archetypes is usually studied in the world of anthropology. Uh -huh. Which is a bridge between me and Greg, by the way. Great bridge. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. It's an anthropological yeah. exercise. Amen. Mm. Okay, so but anybody, if you, if you, if you, Greg, if you uh, apply uh, the idea of archetypes to the levels of mind, you, sp you spoke about, you know, the instinctive level up to the rational, uh, logical level. Is there? Um, how would you? How would you fit yeah. those into each other? Yeah, so, okay, so you have your basic, a uh, couple ways to think about this, but uh, the, when you have your reflex procedural mind, okay, then you move up into what I call the PME mind. This is this dynamic mind. And PME stands for your perceptual input. That's sort of the logos, okay? And then the motive and emotion, that's sort of the pathos, okay? That's what's then driving you. And what animals do is they check what it is and then they have what they, where they want to be in a cybernetic fashion. And then they utilize that to approach and avoid. And then emotion energizes motion to run away, <laughs> to fuck, uh, to flee, to, fe to feed. Okay, that's basically. Now, now what you then get in particular in the social is then that's navigating the material world and praise and predator and territory. Okay, then you jump up into the social primate world. And now you're navigating cooperation, competition, long-term mating, you're offspring okay now you're in the self other world okay and that's when you really have this intuition of hey where am i in the status of the tribe okay who are my alliances okay who are my romantic potential uh, where does that fit with the alpha male if it's a male dominated as many of the primates are okay and then it's navigating what i call that influence social matrix okay and then that, those classic positions, dominant submission, affiliation, hostility, freedom from influence. And I don't mean freedom like as an individual, I mean freedom from the control and obligation of others and navigating that and trying to achieve social influence and value in that structure. And that's archetypally the primate social. Uh, James Mark Baldwin said, ego and altar are born together for a social primate. So it is really this whole point about you, you know your parents before you know yourself because you get mirrored back in there. You get mirrored back by peers. 
you create this social relational matrix. Um, and that is the grounding of these archetypes from my vantage point. And, and the only thing to add there is Simon Kant came up with the idea that we just call it a priori. So this is a priori. Mm -hmm. So before you phenomenologic experience anything, you actually, just because it's cheaper for nature, nature has thrown tons of information into your brain, basically, right. when you're born. Okay, so when you're born, you get out of the matrix. What, what's the first thing you do? You crawl all the way up to the tit and start sucking the tit. That's pre-programmed. That's what we call it today. Mm -hmm. Because the tit is an archetype. The way to describe it is that, yeah, there's the mamilla. I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to hit it. It's called mamilla, right? The mamilla, it's called tit. We talk about a tit or a breast. But in the world of psychoanalysis and philosophy, we call it mamilla because then we're talking about it as an archetype. Mm -hmm. And all the things Greg just mentioned are archetypes, alpha male archetype. You know, all the things, that, what he mentioned when you try to orientate yourselves, all these patterns you try to find, most of them are sort of pre-programmed in you, if you're lucky and you try to orientate yourselves accordingly. It's called a priori in philosophy, then a posteriori is how you make sense of it afterwards. But the point is that these are the archetypes that we orientate ourselves towards in life. And this is exactly why I'm a you know, huge enemy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, okay? Any guy who thinks we're born as tabula rasa, <laughs> no, we are not born blank slates. And the only reason why somebody came up with that idea was of course to try to manipulate us. So that if I'm born a blank slate, then somebody else who was born before me should be able to control me as he so wishes. Why do you think Rousseau was the favorite philosopher of both Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot? Any fucking little Egyptian pharaoh out there in the world will love Rousseau. Why? Because he says we're all born blank slates. No, we are not. We're born with tons of information and we try to reorganize it and get rid of the shit that's not very helpful for us and use the shit that's helpful for us as we orientate ourselves through our lives. That's why I think archetypes are incredibly important in response both to the Platonist forms and the, re the ridiculousness of those and also in response to Rousseau and Blank Slate. We need to get okay. those ideas out of the way. I've got another question from Mehran. Um, he says, you talk about technology or the machine as the prolonging of the man. Is it true to assume the man being a prolonging of the music. I mean, isn't all about how forming our consciousness, uh, how word forming our consciousness, what, this is a bit, um, English is a bit off here, what the theory about the origin of words and music, what about the theory of, uh, of the origin of words and music? How about the tactic knowledge and communication, communicating that stuff? Oh, we're going into so many different things there all at yeah. once. Uh, I don't think we're gonna discuss music theory or linguistics today. But let's go back to the audio that he said something about, about technology of the machine as prolonging of the man. Yes. Okay. The way it goes is this. Uh, women give birth to children. Men envy women for the capacity to give birth to children. Because giving birth to children means you've got a meaning and a purpose with your life. And men don't have that because they don't give birth to children. Uh, so men have to figure out something else that gives them value and purpose in life. Otherwise, they go and kill themselves or become cannon fodder. So... Uh, there is this deep sense that maybe one day a man can give birth to a child. And I think this is the urge of the engineer and the architect. The urge here is to create a technology that makes mankind redundant so that we can also have an end to our existence and die peacefully one day. Now, in Zoroastrianism, this is called Horvatat, to live a full and whole life. And maybe humanity itself is, is actually subconsciously moving towards a point where it would kind of be nice that humanity actually realized that also we are limited and we are finite and there is an end point when humanity stops existing. And I think that is when we would love the idea that by then we would have created something non-human that can survive us. I'd say, or working with the theory in this book, the new one, Process Event, is that we cannot go to outer space. We try to send human bodies up, not to space, and it failed. We can't stand the radiation. We can't send it. We can't live on Mars. The one thing the machine will probably tell us 30 years from now is that, will you just stop going to outer space? I'll take care of that. So the machine will colonize outer space and take some virus and bacteria and synthetic biology with it and start experimenting on other planets. Because the one thing the machine will do is to go to outer space because we can't. We should stay here, fix the planet. <laughs> So maybe that is the first. So all that Star Trek movies maybe are that's just bullshit. The first step <laughs> They're just bullshit. Realizing. 
<laughs> because yeah. there is constraint and constraint mm. is also death and death is the ultimate constraint in the sense that it gives meaning to everything you do. And I think the desperate search humanity has for a meaning for humanity itself cannot really start until the day we accept that the humanity itself has a finite line. And this is where I'm at. I would probably be called the prophet of death when I declared it. But I think it fundamentally is the Zoroastrian. It's a Zoroastrian idea that the ameritat that transcends us as human beings is technology. Okay, I got a question from Walter uh, Bergen. I just want to know if Walter can, can actually ask this question himself, himself. Is it possible? Like, is it technologically possible right now? Or now, is... can, now it seems to be possible. Oh, All right. good. Okay, okay, good. Because well, um, you, 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 it's a long question. I thought it might be better yeah. if, if, you, if you did it yourself. Exactly. Well, thank you so for You can very, turn on your camera it, too so we can see you. That would be wonderful. He's there. Excellent. He's there. Cool. Excellent. Okay, good. Uh, yes. Done. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. And I was thinking a little bit about the statement of how psychology was used to introduce sex into marketing. Mm -hmm. But today, or most recently, last Sunday, I read an article in a large Finnish newspaper where basically the point was sex and marketing is dead. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is this just conscious minds speaking about an environment where, it's, where it is politically not correct to use sex in marketing anymore? Or is there an actual need to use some other pathological or path is another way in marketing and sure. considering say that sex is works in private people watch porn <laughs> but they don't want to associate mm -hmm. the porn the porn they watch in public right oh, all right so they, they, I, yeah yeah you want to start craig and then i'll, I'll no, i mean <laughs> this, this is smash this is smash. <laughs> it's the war of the motor mouse <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll basically say listen there's going to be a developmental history okay um so when you're doing marketing you have a certain amount of, you have a slice of time and you want to basically drop an attentional capture and a positive association that sets the stage for the individual to see the stimulus value of whatever it is that you're selling to draw them to invest in it. That's the task of the marketer. Okay. And that's what it's been. So what they originally dis learned is that they could do it via association, right? You could then have somebody now on the, now there, you can run that so that you saturate it. Okay, so that if everybody, consider it this way. So the first guy that starts selling beer puts a, attractive women next to it. And then it's like, oh my gosh, hey, that's real. And then everybody saturates that. So now there's attractive women next to every one of the beers. Very quickly, people are going to habituate to that and identify that that, because we have, not only do we have attractors, but we also have massive differentiators, okay? Meaning that our investment patterns are gonna track, but we're also gonna be sensitive just to do everything that everybody does. And we're also gonna get habituated in a particular way. So you saturate the market and then all of a sudden you're gonna get all sorts of differentiation, okay? So wherever the market may well be, and that I'm not even getting into ideology about what people are saying is okay and what should and shouldn't be the case and various waves of narrative that then legitimize or don't legitimize what it is that you're doing. So there's all sorts of dynamic processes that will be operative that could give rise to why all of a sudden something's hot for a while and then it's not for a whole host of different reasons. Yeah, what Greg is saying is that these are just fads. Okay. No, sex is not dead. Well, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. That's happening. No, I'll tell you what. That's what not what I meant. Okay. <laughs> this is just a sign of the desperation of marketing today, why marketing is dead. In the 1980s, marketing stopped dealing with the product. We basically left the old way in the bazaar where you said that in the bazaar, you said, here's the best possible product at the best possible price. That's what we call the Walmart universe of how to market stuff, right? Here's the best possible product. That was left in the 1980s and marketing people tended to go off on the huge egos. They read too much Freud, read too much psychology, thought they were too smart and started doing marketing as advertising and advertising was then no longer about the product and the price, but it was about a lifestyle or, or something else associative. And that's when advertisers started giving rewards to each other. They started going to Con and started going to South Beach, Miami, and they got these awards shows and the awards were given to the smartest and the best ad of the year, right? Now that took off on its own and started spinning on its own. And then after, when ads no longer work, because we were sick of them and we didn't want to watch them and remove them, 
all human beings with any sense of mind, any consciousness out there, any mind, will have spam filters and ad blockers like that because we hate ads. Ad people are the horse of the planet. We hate advertising. <laughs> and ad people are the scum of the earth. Yeah. That's the honest truth. They're the scum of the earth. So we hate ads, right? And they don't like that we hate them because they like to think they're noble and, and nice and go to VIP lounges and VIP bars and want to get laid. And we're like, oh, you're just a marketing person? No, so they went from advertising to marketing. When marketing is just another more desperate level, marketing was then like, okay, let's completely remove the product from marketing. And let's say the company is doing something that really has nothing to do with the product. And eventually in the last 10 years, that has become communication. What the fuck is that? The way I say it is that you're supposed to sell a mattress in a furniture store in Manchester, but you're pretending you're investing in bakeries in Burundi. It's called woke. Okay. <laughs> woke is now means that the entire, speaking of emergence vectors, the entire sphere of marketing and advertising has gone off on its own and is now only rewarding itself for its own cleverness that has nothing to do with being commercially successful with anything any longer. And I'm just waiting for companies to discover this. Woke doesn't sell shit. If you take sex away of fashion, it's fashion is dead. They have these fat, ugly people doing a walk, you know, a, one of those catwalks in Paris the other week. And I heckled them on Twitter and said, listen, when you start selling trousers and selling underwear because you're fat and ugly, then come back to me. Because all I can see with a catwalk full of fat and ugly people is that you're protesting the fact that you failed at your diet and your plastic surgery didn't work and you're talentless fucking losers. And we're all dying for a beautiful woman to come out on the stage again, dressed by a gay guy that has some kind of taste, dressed in a fur, drenched in blood, and fashion will be back with a vengeance. Because sex yeah. sells. It always did. Okay. This but, is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Marketing is what's dead. Sex is dead. Are you kidding? I'm investing in the pornography industry more than ever. Pornhub is what saves us when YouTube is over. No, <laughs> I'm totally with the sex workers of the world. And I agree with Thaddeus Russell's that it was always the very people you despise the most that created civilization. I'm totally with Thaddeus Russell on the renegade history of America. We need to remind ourselves that the people who actually leave Egypt and walk to the promised land are precisely the people who are fed up and walk out. And they're always sex workers and sluts and witches and shamans and weirdos. It's called Burning Man these days. And they invented Twitter. So there you go. Sex sells more than ever. Uh, um, all righty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Far. Clear answer. <laughs> do you know? Do you know Thank why you for the, the holy no, gospel? <laughs> I give you. A, I give you an interesting note here. Do you know why fashion is dead? Fashion is dead because straight women and straight men took over fashion. And why were they allowed to do that? Because the gay guys died from AIDS between 1984 and 1995. Now, if you wipe out a generation of geniuses, you get exactly what Germany was after 1945. Germany has suffered from a lack of smart Jews ever since 1945, and it's been Germany's big trauma ever since. If you wipe out a certain population, you will have a tremendous damage onto your society. And the fact that we don't have gay guys around means that Broadway is nothing but recycling old stupid musicals for old ladies. There's no theater left any longer. There's, no, there's nowhere, there's not where the gay talent would have gone. It's just, I, I think Douglas Murray hasn't even seen this. We would agree strongly with me if I said it. Marley on a pole certainly agrees with me. So if the gay guys are gone and of culture, art is dead. Because gay guys are fundamental to artistic expression. They're overrepresented constantly, and so are lesbian women, by the way. If you take the androgynous out of the population like you did with, with all the gay guys, because they were wiped out over 10 years' time, all the smart ones, because all the smart ones were good looking and got fucked, and those are the guys who died. It was the mediocre gays who survived and got married, just so you know, right? So that's why fashion is dead. Fashion will probably come back, but I don't think women should dress themselves because when women dress themselves, they go very conservative and conformist and have the same colors every season. And it's always <clears throat> It's beige after beige after beige. That's why fashion is dead. For a lack of talent, nothing else. Sex sells. It also kills. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and follow it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to argue with that. Do we have some more questions? 
We have 10 minutes. Does anybody who hasn't asked a question right now want to jump in? Maybe some offended straight woman who decides. Somebody, is somebody very offended and wants to, wants to <laughs> smack. Um, oh, there, there are lots of great comments and things, but uh, I yeah. Think, yeah, is there a fresh new question? Not just further comments. No further comments. Because we had, we had I some questions. Also, there's people on Facebook too who are, who are watching. Um, oh, Eric has his mute off. Oh, here we go. Alexander. Hello there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank go ahead. you for being part of this. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You have to tell me if it's uh, going off grid. Uh, but I'm, I'm totally super interested when you, you talk about the marketing, Alexander. And um, I'm wondering, you know, when all these new nodes is creating and, and people are getting closer to the production roles, I mean, they are part of being part of the products. I'm also wondering how, how could, um, I mean, are they the product or are they the marketing? Or, I mean, the communication out in the channels. And I, I really get confused about this and thinking about it at the time. But yeah, maybe it's out of, of the path of this uh, uh, conversation, but. Uh, okay, I think my point was that marketing is very, very, very desperate, okay? So marketing is trying to more, tell more and more desperate stories. And the way they do this, they attach something to the product and say, by the way, this product came from here and here. And it was born in this year. Well, I think we're so sick and tired of these nonsensical stories that we basically, if you want a carpet, we buy a carpet now. And I think during the Corona months, it's become absolutely obvious because the e-commerce websites that are exploding at the moment are actually going back to best product, best possible price. I think the mm -hmm. bazaar is back in a big way already. We just haven't seen it yet because the marketing departments of large corporations haven't understood it. They're going to go into high speed. Okay, the way is this, before something dies, it goes on to a mode, and this is actually in all the emergence vectors, maybe. It's like a supernova or something. Supernova, yeah. So the supernova means that before something dies, it just explodes out of a kind of desperation before it implodes dramatically. That is, for example, why religious fundamentalism should be understood as something at the end of a life cycle of a religious idea. Mm. Before it implodes, and just disappear. That's why we've had Christian fundamentalism and Islamic fundamentalism only in the last 100 years, not before. Because before that, Islamic Christianity were victorious, popular religions that you traded around the world, and, you know. But it, because they were under such pressure, they went into fundamentalist mode. It's the same thing. I would say that marketing today in the 2020s is so damn desperate, that it's so high pitched, has such huge budgets. Corporations are so desperate to try to get some kind of contact with your damn eyeballs. <laughs> and you hate them so much and they haven't figured it out yet. It's like, it's like I said, marketing today is like a guy who walks into a bar and thinks he's God's gift to mankind and is met by a thousand women who will spit at him. And he still doesn't go home and kill himself. This is like, if everybody hates you of the opposite gender and you can't even go gay, although you try, and even the gays hate you, kill yourself, you know, die, please die. It's like, it's like, it's like a zombie, right? Now. That's what marketing is. And that's also, I think Facebook will die because when Facebook hired thousands of psychologists, the exact opposite of Greg here, we didn't understand, there was no interest in what psychology was. They were whores who sold themselves to the devil by being told that where you're gonna sit here and use whatever you learned at university when you became a psychologist to now make millions of people into addicts. Addicts of something absolutely meaningless, which is called being a Facebook troll. Okay, Facebook is evil, it deserves to die. It, 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 it added no value to humanity. We got the social gram and it was crap too. We couldn't even remove friends who were no longer friends. It was so bad. It was just like a bad sales pitch thrown into all our lives that we now all desperately trying to get rid of. And, and it, because it was run by 25 year old boy Farrell called Mark Zuckerberg and no experience of life. A boy cannot run an empire. He doesn't understand what it means to be human. He does not understand psychology in its most fundamental sense. He does not understand anthropology and he certainly doesn't understand philosophy. 
And Do we need a new emperor, perhaps, of the no, social I, network? Well, no, we, we're stuck with an anarchy now because Silicon Valley is uh -huh. failing miserably. Washington, D.C. is failing miserably. And this is the same pattern everywhere in the world right now. Governments are failing, but also old industry is failing because industry does not understand digital either because digital is a brutal wake-up call for humanity towards truth and honesty because everything from now on will be remembered and processed and thrown back at you. Stop talking bullshit, you know? And advertising was all about forcing you to eat bullshit before you die and they take your liver from you. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, I, I totally agree with, uh, about the tiredness of marketing. Uh, but I try to feel I, I'm uh, actually part of uh, to create value with a lot of creators on, on both YouTube and Instagram and such. And we have a, mm -hmm. a lot of brands that, that want to have awareness and, and, uh, and have reach or sales. And, and I'm, I'm so tired of, uh, uh, oh, I just want to produce value in these channels. And right. um, I see that the creators are being more part of the production role. For example, let's take a, a shoe designer. Maybe he could design a, a speaker as well. And, and then they can do something new and, uh, and be part of the product as well as the communication in their channels. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I feel a bit confused sometimes where, where the uh, difference between these two. I'll I tell you what, I'll tell you what. Greg and I are part of something that I would like to call the Aristotelian revival. Mm -hmm. You have a problem because you haven't figured out where you're gonna end. You don't have to discuss the final cause of that process. Mm. Are these speakers and shoes even asked for? Probably not. Then fuck them. So the I ideal don't... would be to have the best speaker and shoe and, 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 and get people to go for that, right? If you make the best shoe in the world and put it out there and have five people look at that shoe, I guarantee that the algorithms will come your way very quickly because the algorithms are trained not to look at quantity, but to look at quality. So you don't need marketing. No, not if you're good. If you're smart today, you don't do marketing. All the people that are very successful that I know today are not using marketing at all. I developed H&M's new brand. They folded it because they couldn't believe the idea was too early, but I did. And I did it with a team with Oscar Olson and, and Stina Forrest and some other guys. And, and it was called Naiden. And it was actually a whole idea. The entire idea was to, to completely eliminate and even make it impossible to use marketing anywhere in the process. Hmm. But it could be an absolute authentic idea of making clothes. Mm -hmm. What would that be if you started fresh today? I don't, think, I don't think product development should be anything else today. I think by trying to make it a, a riddle you have to solve to save people's wallets, you haven't, you haven't even started being sustainable here. Because if you were sustainable, you go straight to what Aristotle claims when he tells Plato to get down on earth. He says that mm -hmm. get, up from the, get out of the sky, get down to earth. Get, get rid of your forms and get down to earth. What is the final cause of the process you're talking about? Is there a need for shoes somewhere in the world? Well, mm -hmm. probably if there is, probably can make their own shoes. They don't even need your shoemakers or shoe designers or whatever. Because I think you're surrounding yourself with narcissistic people who think they're so fucking creative and the God's gift to mankind and the shoe or the speaker they just created must be the most fantastic shoe or speaker ever created. Well, if it is, put it out there online on a simple e-commerce website and see if you get any hits at all. Let the digital realm judge you. And if you do make the best speaker in the world, you will be number one in the algorithm and you right. will not have put a single ad on Google search. You'll still be number one. You'll sell more speakers than you ever thought. So because the digital both, realm is the judge. <laughs> the digital yeah. realm is a massive judge. This is the scary thing uh -huh, with crypto. It's uh -huh, also an unforgiving uh -huh. judge. Yeah. But what it is, is that it's a massive judge that comes into history like never before. And it will totally expose fraud. It will totally okay. expose the lack of quality. I think this is a time to focus on quality. And for anybody who wants to do economics, which is what I did before I became a philosopher, I said, read Milton Friedman, because they probably tell you not to read him because he's out of date, then read him. And if you're gonna okay. study science, study Karl Lagerfeld. Don't listen to all these women <laughs> around around in base sustainability because they're gonna be gone in no time at all. No, now look at the timeless qualities right now because the bazaar is back in a big way. And the bazaar is about the best product at the best possible price with the smoothest delivery.
That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's almost, uh, right. we're up to the two hour point and uh, I think it's great that we've ended on, on, on you know, if we started- We've with ended this, with Amazon, which is the biggest- We've ended, we started with this high high abstract discussion and we, we kind of landed at, uh, at, uh, at, at the most basic kind of, kind of shit. So that's kind of interesting. It could have gone the other way around. We could have started with marketing and got more complex, mm -hmm. but- Mm -hmm. but uh but anyway that was that was very awesome uh guys um do you want to say a couple uh parting uh remarks or anything any last words uh sure i'll i'll, I'll bounce off of that and say god i hate marketing <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know i've been working on this Fuck marketing Fuck 1997 it. My, my you know my i just burrowed into what it was that i was trying to do and that's what i cared about you know um so uh yeah. so that, that's a that's an int i was an interesting echo as i heard so i for me basically what i what i believe is that there's a new enlightenment dark renaissance uh um, um, a way of thinking about philosophy about psychoanalysis about science um that i can provide that i think can provide uh if we can march match that effectively with the emergence of the digital then we can find a path uh, toward the future that is sane and healthy and all that. But I think it's going to be bumpy. Uh, and I think we're in the process of feeling our way to the future right now. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, have this conversations and do our little part in relationship to that. I agree strongly with Greg. Uh, we call it dark renaissance because it, I think Rachel Haywire came up with a word or somebody like that. Somebody should have created it. Yeah. Dark renaissance means that it's going to be messy the next 30 to 50 years. Really, really messy. Uh, and, and to get some kind of order in that case, we need these civilized discussions and we need a return in a massive way towards wisdom uh, away from the whole idea that, you, you, you know, the whole idea that you, you're born and you know everything. <laughs> you know. Children are not gods. <laughs> Let's put it there. Let's put it there. Just, just get the order of life properly again, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, the Renaissance psychology is important. And what Greg and I share is that I, always when people ask me how you do philosophy is that, yeah, you do write books, but actually that's not the primary way of doing philosophy. It's the drawing board. And where Greg and I meet is that we do drawing boards. And that's why it started the tree of knowledge and, and you know, take in Greg's enormous wisdom and all the years of work he put into creating the tree of knowledge and study it and understand that when I do philosophy, I do the same thing. I sit at the drawing board for months at end and eventually even years. And then out of that, eventually I, I draw out a text that I sit with John Sedek Fist and I formulate, mm -hmm. and that's a book. But actually both philosophy and psychology, both art and science are done in studios at drawing boards. That's how you get to grips with the world. Amen. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Great conclusion, I think. So th thanks so much, uh, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, and uh, come and, and visit us again uh, at Parallax. We have more lectures coming up soon. And, um, and, and hopefully just keep getting, uh, you know, getting, getting, we're, we're doing a drawing board here, I, th I think. This is part of the drawing board. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So, so th thanks. Thanks so much, everybody.